three hours of the very best entitled parent stories of the year. Starting with this one in which an entitled dad demands that his one-year-old join in with a game of football. My older boys are playing soccer. Parents let their one-year-old interrupt them. I think this belongs here. What the heck would two parents be thinking by letting their barely walking child waddle over to where my boys are playing a rough game of soccer? He proceeds to walk into the net, get between my boys, who are 8 and 11, and pitch a fit over not getting my son's ball. The dad, the entitled dad, noticed I said something and got offended that I was ticked. Yes, get your kid away from my kids before a soccer ball plops him in the face. Ugh, maddening. The little toddler winds up pitching a fit so bad he shrieking over it and they had to leave this is a dad with entitlement issues right next time how do i proceed i told my sons to tell the parents that he's going to get his face hurt by the ball i feel like there's very little you can actually do here except let the inevitable happen if this entitled dad is not going to drag his one-year-old son away from a game of football then eventually yeah he's going to get hit in the face and maybe that's the only way he'll learn sorry but it might just have to happen yeah of course give the parent and the kid a warning but if they're not going to move away then just keep playing and eventually unfortunately he's going to get hurt My entitled parents won't stop trying to convince us to have an abortion. This happened a few years ago, but I'm telling it online for the first time now. I am a 40 year old man and I moved from China to the US when I was eight years old. And my parents have always used Chinese culture as an excuse for their behavior. Growing up, my dad enjoyed beating me whenever he had a bad day at work or just wanted to step on someone while my mum preferred to wear me down by methodically telling me I was a failure and did every little thing wrong. She never acknowledged me as a person with my own goals, thoughts, and preferences, but rather as an extension of her, whose sole existence is to be demeaned, humiliated, and controlled for her amusements. When I got engaged, my original plan was to exclude them entirely, but my wife, who believes strongly in the bonds of family, convinced me otherwise. My parents, mostly my mother, waged a year-long campaign to convince me to break up the engagement because my fiancé is and was white. Every week, I received at least one phone call or email telling me how much American women don't respect family, like to divorce, or some similar arguments. Once we got married, their mission transitioned from preventing the wedding to breaking up the marriage, with non-stop comments and questions about all the things my wife should be doing as a wife, as well as occasionally trying to introduce me to nice Chinese girls. This continued well after we had our son, which my mum declared didn't look like me, then my daughter. And this leads us to our current story. For medical reasons, my wife had multiple miscarriages before having our daughter, and things became even more difficult when we tried to have a third child. It took years and many visits to multiple fertility clinics before my wife finally got a successful pregnancy. As a disobedient son, I've neglected to mention that my mum considered one son and one daughter to be ideal. As soon as she found out about the pregnancy, she shifted her usual campaign of wearing down my relationship with my wife to one of convincing us to abort our third child. Sometimes she would just state matter-of-factly that one son and one daughter is best. Sometimes she would pretend she cared about my happiness. Sometimes she spoke as if my wife's desire to keep our third child was a sign of her disrespecting me as a head of the family. My mum would cry, saying how sad it was that I didn't appreciate her and use many other paternal manipulation tools. This went on non-stop until our healthy third child, second son, was born. I have obviously disobeyed my parents from early childhood, and almost all of my worthwhile accomplishments arose from disobeying at least one, if not both of them, but I never consistently pushed back on the verbal campaign until recently. I don't know if my father knows I have the ability to speak, but my mother acted shocked that I could possibly think of her as anything other than a fully self-sacrificing mother who cares only for my well-being. What I did sounds unpleasant, but I finally realized that my mother cares only for her immediate short-term comfort, and so the only way to get her to understand the words coming out my mouth is to make her uncomfortable with direct accusations and insults. She still doesn't understand, admit, or acknowledge anything, but she's finally accepted after all these years that I do not believe that she is the best mother in the world. Now, don't get me wrong, I do agree with your wife that a family bond is very important, but not in this situation when your parents are as horrible and manipulative and controlling as this. Cut contact, my friend. I know it's tough, they're your parents, but you have to cut contact for your own sake, for your wife's sake, and for your children's sake. You do not want your parents to be a part of your life anymore, trust me. Sick entitled mother puts my asthmatic toddler at risk. 
I am a 35 year old woman and I frequently travel to visit my family about five hours away. I travel with my toddler, who's a one and a half year old girl who hates the car, so we make frequent stops. My last trip was during the school holidays here, so there were lots of families with children everywhere we stopped. Now, of course, this is no issue until we ran into this one selfish entitled family. We stopped for some food and a play at a server we normally stop at. It's got a big shady grass area that my daughter, Danny, likes because she can run and play in. So I get a coffee from inside and we head over to the grass area where I park the car so Danny can play. Now we have a few vulnerable people in our family, including Danny. So we're still very careful about COVID and I purposefully parked away from the main area so that we could limit our interactions with strangers. As we make our way back to the car, I notice the family spread across the grass area one adult male, three adult females, and three children, approximate ages of three, five, and 10, they were all girls. The children and the entitled mother of the story were playing in the area close to my car. And when we got back, the children flocked straight to me. Then, as soon as the eldest, the 10 year old, who was a lovely girl, polite and happy, started talking to me, and the younger two started playing with Danny, their entitled mum just turned around and walked back to the other adults, who were 15 to 20 meters away from my car. She didn't even look back at us. Like seriously, what the frick? Now this annoyed me so much. Like really, who just leaves their young children to play and be supervised by a stranger? I love kids, so I'd never be rude to them. Plus they were lovely kids, just not mine. And I really just wanted to drink my coffee while Danny played before we had to get back into the car. So as much as this annoyed me, I didn't let the children know. They're just kids. The eldest child and I chatted away as the young ones played. She was a real talker and we spoke for about 10 minutes. Then Danny, who has asthma, started coughing. So I told the oldest child to excuse me as I needed to get Danny's puffer out of the car. That's when the girl said to me, my mum and dad have a bad cough too, from the virus. My heart sunk, but I asked what virus it was. The COVID one, she replied. Instantly, my internal rage went from mildly irritated to I'm about to lose my head. I told the girl that it was nice speaking with her, but we had to leave. I picked up Danny and took her straight to the car. I pulled out the hand sanitizer spray and her puffer and I sorted us both out. I sat there seething and quietly freaking in the back seat with Danny while she ate some fruits. We were on the way to visit elderly, extremely vulnerable family, and I ended up turning around and driving three hours home because I couldn't risk them getting sick if we'd gotten COVID from that family. I was so angry and worried for my asthmatic daughter. If you are sick, COVID or otherwise, and you have to be out in public, don't interact with anyone, especially without a mask. And healthy or sick, don't leave your children with strangers. Jeez, I hate stupid, selfish, and entitled people. Well, don't we all? It's bad enough in this day and age interacting with anyone when you are actually sick. I mean, even a cough is bad enough. You don't want to give someone else a cough or a cold. It's not that nice, is it? But letting your children roam freely and interacting with other people when you have COVID, obviously something that has killed millions, is nuts. It should be illegal. Don't get me wrong, I know in the UK and other places right now there are no restrictions, but still, be courteous. If you know you have COVID, wear a mask at the very least if you go outside and don't chat to random people in the public. Like, are you nuts? My parents think I shouldn't have changed my name, even though it didn't serve me. Based off my post history, I, a 19 year old woman, have explained how I was at my wits end with the name I was given at birth. It didn't fit me. I was tired of the remarks, the mispronunciations, the misspellings. No more people asking if I'm a guy when other people mention my name, and then they see me, and I'm a nice looking girl with a masculine ass name. I felt a certain way about my name since I was little. Luckily, I changed it, and it's been officially changed for about a week now. I have a feminine, fierce name now. I can breathe. I'm proud to introduce myself without hesitation. It feels nice coming from my mouth. I'm not embarrassed anymore. Now, the thing is, my parents do not like my decision. A couple of days ago, my dad said I should have told him before I changed it, as if I need his permission. Plus, he lives in another state and we don't have the closest relationship. He was hurt by it though, but he didn't outright tell me. He said your name is your name for a reason and he's going to keep calling me my birth name. Okay, I guess that was the case when I was born, but my life hasn't been sunshine when it comes to what I was named at birth. 
I explained to him that I just wanted to be named something feminine. He asked to see my paperwork to see if it was legit and I had no problem sending him a picture. Today, I told my mum about his reaction and she said she didn't blame him. Then she proceeded to go off the deep end and compare my name change to how trans people change their gender. What did me changing my name have to do with trans people? She can be so ridiculous. You give me a name that is literally fit for a male, not to mention a feminine middle name that would have been perfect as my first name, and then you want to bring up trans people just because you don't agree with me changing my name? That makes no sense. She said she's not calling me by my new name because she didn't name me that. I still live at home and trust me, I've been trying to get out for years. I just so happen to be doing online community college and live at home, but my dream is to move states and get an apartment far, far away from this BS. I can go somewhere and start over entirely and tell my name to new people who don't know me by my given name. I'll probably even start over on social media too while I'm at it. My parents can feel the way they want to, but I have to live with them. They don't want to call me by my new name, but it's not like I can ignore them. Hardly anybody in my family calls me my new name, actually. They don't want to, I guess. What can I do? I'm not changing my name back to what it was. Well, although it's tough, the answer is pretty obvious. You should do exactly what you said you were going to do. Start afresh. Sack them off. Move to a new place get new friends, do new social media, whatever. Reinvent yourself, reinvent your life in the same way that you've reinvented your name. That's what I'd suggest. Subsidized childcare means I don't have to pay you. I worked in childcare for half of my working life at different centers, but also as a nanny and babysitter. As you can imagine, I've got a whole lot of entitled parent stories from these years. This is just one of the many from when I was a nanny to a little boy with disabilities. He was very sweet, but his mum was very entitled. First of all, I took this particular job because I needed something income-wise so I could keep my apartment. I stuck with this job longer than I should have, and I regretted it. The entitled mum was working, but was a single mum, and her kid needed medical and behavioural interventions, so she got state assistance. The state gave me this job through the Welfare Employment Office. With childcare that is state subsidised, the government pays part of the wage and the parent pays the rest. That's how it's supposed to work anyway. This was in 2005, so minimum wage was $7.25 per hour. The government was supposed to pay half, and the parent was supposed to pay half, according to the contract for this job. It varies depending on what the family needs. So the state paid me $3.66 per hour, and the entitled mum was supposed to pay me $3.65 per hour at the end of each day. I met with the family and talked over these terms. Everything was agreed upon and signed by both parties. Then I turned a copy of the paperwork back into the employment office for their records. The next full day, my first full day of working with the entitled mum and her kid, the whole day went pretty well. Mostly the kid and I getting used to each other, him testing boundaries a bit, and me enforcing routines that were already established. Pretty standard for the first day. The entitled mum comes home and her kid went running up to her, eager to show off his art project that we were working on. I had a date, so I asked the mum for my day's wages. She looked absolutely stunned and asked, but don't you get paid by the office for this? I explained how it was supposed to work and showed her the paperwork that we'd both signed the day before, agreeing that she was supposed to pay her part every day. She said, but that's not how it works. I can't do that much. She was horrified that she would have to pay anything, thinking that $3.65 per hour was a livable wage. It was torture trying to get her to pay me anything at all. Because I was making progress with the kid and no one else wanted to be assigned to this family, I stayed. The entitled mum paid me $5 per day plus food and transportation costs, but that's the maximum I was ever able to get from her. I did end up having to give up my apartment and move in with my boyfriend, now my husband. I changed jobs soon after that, so maybe eight months total, working for the entitled mum and her sweet kid. Yeah, so one word here uh, that springs to mind, fraud. Because you've signed a contract and you haven't kept up with the terms of that contract. That is fraudulent behavior of the highest accord. Also, who can live on $5 a day? Sorry, what? That's, that is incredible. How can you sign something? Surely she read it, I mean, maybe she didn't. And then question it, uh, astonishing, $5 a day. Wow, won't let you mooch anymore. I have this friend from uni who is a 37 year old woman. She's much older than me. The reason I mention this is I managed to get a really good job after finishing uni and I also scored very well. 
even after my disabilities and getting into a major accident. Since I live in a different country, I had no one to help me in these situations and I'm proud I still managed to reach where I am now. So I met this friend at a friend's dinner party. From the first glance, she tried hard to be close to me. I didn't really understand in the beginning, but she also very quickly shared a lot of her own problems and issues. My mistake was I gave her some solutions and I also helped her to resolve a few of them. Now, every now and then she started to call for any help. Can you do groceries for me? I'm not well, I'm so lonely, no one's there for me. So I thought, all right, I'll buy her groceries, but I never got the money back. She invites me for coffee. I have to pay for everything. She even eats my food. This started to affect my mental health. She'd call me at work and wants to talk about her mental health all the time while I'm the one being treated for PTSD and anxiety. I soon moved to my own place. I invited all my friends for dinner, her as well. She soon announced that she would be moving in with me. I was shocked. I said no, I got my apartment so I can have my own place. After a lot of back and forth, she stopped. Now she moved back to her own country a few months ago, but she wants to come back here to find work. She again asked me if she can stay at my place. I asked for how long. She said a few weeks or it could be months. I said, I cannot do that. She told me one of her very kind friends agreed to let her stay with them. At the last moment when she arrived here, the kind friend said they never actually agreed to let her stay with her and she misunderstood. Now she calls me and asks if my guest can leave so that she can come and stay. I have my other friend over for a few weeks. At this point, I thought she'd made all this up to use my own guilt emotions against me, but I still told her I cannot but she had the audacity then to call me names and whatnot. I decided to finally cut her and call her on her BS. I know I get called names and how selfish I am, but I'm fine with that. Yeah, good on you, OP. Oh, it's actually so sad, isn't it? Sometimes people that are the most genuine and kind clearly like OP. I mean, offering to do someone else's groceries for them when you're going through so much yourself is crazy selfless. I rate that so highly. They're the ones that usually get walked over the most. It's sad to see, but it happens. Like when you get people as gracious as this, they do often get taken advantage of, which is such a shame. But I guess it's up to people like you and me to make sure those really gracious people that we have in our lives feel super worthwhile and just know how amazing they are. My ex's mother is mad at me for breaking up with her angel boy. So basically, I, a 15-year-old girl, and my ex, a 15-year-old boy, broke up a little over a month ago. In the first couple of weeks, my friends were comforting me. For some background, he was manipulative and forced me to do things I didn't want to, like sending photos, etc. It took me over two months to finally break up with him. Like I said before, the first couple of weeks after the breakup, I was just being comforted. Then after that, his mother began harassing me with messages and voicemails. It was just mild at first, although I never answered the calls because I was scared of his mother. Her son was one of those boys who always acted differently in front of certain people. And I was stupid enough not to see that this was a very red flag. Anyway, his mother obviously thinks he is an angel sent from heaven who can do no wrong. So when I told her about what he did to me, she lost her head. She started spam calling and spam texting me. I, as a teenager, was very afraid. So I shut my phone off and decided to just leave it for a bit and hope things would die down. The next morning, when I checked my phone, I had over 100 text messages and 35 missed calls. I checked through all of them. The texts were, of course, the typical, how dare you? My child is an angel. He would never do that to anyone. Cursing me out and all that stuff but the voicemails were more vulgar. She said that she was going to find where I live and hurt me. And in one of the voicemails, I will never forget what she said. You, young lady, are a very spoiled brat. You are just sad that you can't get my son to send to you. So you're making all of those lies and fibs up so that you can gain some sort of dominance? You will never, and I mean never, have any man in your life ever again because of this. I hope that you end up lonely and miserable because that is all you'll ever be. And then it ended with some rustling and muffled yelling before it beeped. But at that point, I was having a panic attack and couldn't breathe. That was a couple of days ago. Of course, he hasn't and won't tell his mother the truth so he can keep his angelic image. But lately, he's been texting me and saying that I should drop all of this because his mother won't stop yelling at him to call me or text me. My friends tell me that I shouldn't because I'm not in the wrong, but I think I am. Now, before I comment on this story, Opie has given us a little update. 
This morning, I told my parents about what happened and asked them if they could give her a call to talk to her, the ex's mum, I assume. They haven't told me anything yet because they're both at work, but I haven't got any more messages or calls from my ex. Neither my parents nor me want to get police involved in case it goes too far and we might end up going to court. We don't have much money to spare for a lawyer, so we try to solve most things by ourselves. My dad is an ex-police officer, so he knows and understands how wrong all of this is. I am, however, grounded for a bit, seeing as I had a boyfriend. I was going to tell them, but then I broke up with him, so I didn't see a point until all of this started happening. I'm going to wait until tomorrow morning to see if they call or text me again. If not, I'll block his number on everything. If they do, I'm handing my phone over to my parents. Well, there you go, OP. It sounds like you're doing the right thing and you have the right mindset. What I would say is there's no way you're in the wrong here. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? You're the one that's getting harassed by a mother of your ex at the age of 15. Uh, If anyone's in the wrong here, which they are, it's definitely her. No, mum, dad, younger brother, and aunt, I'll keep on doing my little tradition. I, a 27-year-old woman, had an older brother, a 25-year-old male, who died in 2014. He was the older brother any girl would want, and we were close. He taught me valuable lessons in life, such as cooking, driving, and never giving up. Showed me anime manga, would go on little road trips, and we flat out ignore our parents' favoritism with my younger brother. Sadly, he died when a shooting happened. He was not a criminal, he was only eating when it happened. And there was an investigation, and police found he was not involved in any illegal activity. One of the bullets killed him instantly, He was only 25 and I was 19 in 2014. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't fall into a deep depression. It came to the point where I stopped eating and lost around 55 pounds in a month and a half after his passing. I only drank water and milk that would fill me up. I didn't want to get better until one day my former sister-in-law called me to tell me that he left me some things. I met up with her and the stuff he left behind was an album with Polaroid pictures of our crazy adventures, graphic anime tees, and a chain with both of our initials. I was in tears, and I decided to get help because he would love to see me happy and not dying of sadness. It's been years since his passing, and I'm doing a lot better. And I have a tradition that on his birthday, I leave flowers at his grave. I only stay for two minutes and then leave after singing him happy birthday. My therapist said this was a good idea. However, my parents, younger brother, and aunt decided to have an intervention thinking religiously that I was doing something satanic, that I was calling out the dead, that they should have thrown the things he left me in the garbage, and that I should attend to their church to see if the Lord gets those diabolical ideas out of your head. I was shocked and told them that I won't stop doing this tradition and I won't be attending their church, that this is their older son and that if they keep behaving like this, I won't feel bad at all for having to go no contact with them. They kept on yelling at me and my aunt went as far as to throw holy water at me. I'd had it at this point and told them that when they stop being religious nuts, we'll talk. But as of today, I want nothing to do with them. I left before any of them could say anything. It's been a week since the incident and I've blocked their numbers. I just saved myself from toxic family members and I won't go back there ever again. I mean, listen, don't get me wrong. I'm not religious myself, but I'm all for religion. You can practice whatever you want. I don't care. In fact, I encourage it. Do what makes you happy. However, when it gets to a situation like this and your religion has come to this extent to which you are literally choosing to pretty much forget your dead relative, yeah, that's too far for me. By all means, do what you want personally, but when you're preaching your ideology and your thoughts onto somebody else and using religion as an excuse, yeah, that's too far. That is nuts. Fair play to you, OP, for going no contact. I rate that highly. My mother called me selfish for wanting to be an organ donor and cremated when I die. My mother said this years ago. My brother passed away suddenly from cancer in 2019, 27 hours after being diagnosed. Oh my God. He was 37. It tore our family apart from the grief. It's caused us to make up our living wills and how we like to be buried. I was close to my brother, so he told me what he wanted if he died four years before he did. I planned his funeral and everything. My mother trusted me and was pleased at how I planned it. The day after his funeral, we were talking about how he wanted our bodies to be handled after our death. I told her I wanted to donate my organs and whatever is left, I want it cremated and most of my ashes scattered. If family wanted to keep some, they can. My mother asked how else will she visit my grave? I told her I don't want a grave. And again, I said they can have some of my ashes and plan a funeral if they like. 
I don't really care if I get a funeral or not, personally. Then she told me it's a sin to not have your body intact when going into heaven. When I reminded her I am a non-believer, she started calling me selfish for putting a burden on her by making her think I'm going to hell for my body not being intact and an atheist. She started calling me selfish for not having a grave for her and family to visit and selfish for not letting family keep all my ashes. When I told her my body, my choice, my mother started to cry and said, well, if you die before me, I'll make sure you have a grave. I don't care what you want. How could you be so self-absorbed? I felt bad and apologized. She said, think about someone else for once. Do you know how selfish it is to want to pollute the environment with human remains? Yeah, I know now that I said nothing wrong, but at the time I felt like the butthole for not letting my family visit my grave. So that's why I apologized. Since then, I wrote a living will because I can't trust my mother to handle my wishes. Recently, when the conversation steered to death and burial, I again repeated my wishes. My mother said, No, you're not. I'm not going to live the rest of my life thinking my daughter is in hell. I'll plan everything for you. Okay, mum. I mean, ultimately, this is a pretty tough one. There's not much more you can do other than write your living will and make sure that the family members you actually like and trust know about it. Apart from that, yeah, if you're dead, you're dead. I mean, for what it's worth, I think it's pretty disrespectful that your mum can't even accept your dying wishes. It is your life after all. And look, obviously it's going to be extremely sad and unlikely, let's be realistic, that you die before your mum, but it's your life and she should respect that. Other than that, gotta say, it sounds like a lovely woman. What's her number? Now for our final story of today's episode. Now this one, trust me, you're going to enjoy. Turning the lights off doesn't make it cooler. Current heatwave in the UK reminded me of a massive blowout at a previous job back in 2017. I returned to work after a period of sickness. I came into the office to find that the lights are off and the aircon is off too. Now, in the UK, aircon is still not standard, and being in an office where the sun hits you most of the day, it was bliss to have it on. We had filters on our windows to stop people looking in and seeing our computer screens, but they did not stop the heat coming through. The office was like an oven. My little desk fan did nothing, and having the lights off meant that I could barely see my screen, let alone my desk. I raised this with my manager, who was the office health and safety rep, and was told that two of the 20 people in the office didn't like the lights on because it made them feel hotter. So they turned off all the lights. I asked then if they felt hot, why turn off the air con? And the answer, because they didn't like the air blowing on them where they sat. The temperature in the office was hitting 26 degrees Celsius, that's 78 Fahrenheit, and the light levels were like trying to work at dusk. I told my boss that I couldn't work under these conditions because they were triggering the condition that I'd been off with and I was told to go work in another office. I then tried to bring it up with the two people who caused this by asking why they'd chosen to turn off the aircon and the lights and I was told that they felt too hot with the lights on and the aircon blew directly on them which was too annoying. Now the lighting was ultra low emission lighting so it gave out no heat. And when I said this, I was told that it didn't matter because it was how they felt. And if you have a problem with that, then go work somewhere else. I put my concerns in writing to my boss and got an email back telling me to go find another office to work in. But before I could move, he would have to approve it. Now, I was on the company H&S team, which sat over the office reps, i.e. my boss. And at the next meeting, I brought up that I understood that there were no minimum or maximum heat requirements for an office, but what were we to do if it was hitting 26 degrees Celsius, but the aircon was off? I was told by our CFO, obviously, to turn on the aircon. I explained that two out of 20 people didn't want it on. The CFO scribbled down something and said he'd look into it. I then brought up minimum light levels, for which there is legislation, and how we were falling below those. My husband had lent me a light meter to check, which I did one lunchtime when most of the team were out. The CFO asked why it was so dark, and I said that those same two people insisted on all the lights being off because it felt hotter with them on. Again, frantic scribbling. I was off the next day, and then it was the weekend. I came in on the Monday to the aircon on, the lights on, and the two moaners glaring at me. 
Then my boss calls me into a meeting and tells me that he got shouted at by his boss, the big boss, because the CFO had come to him and torn him a new one over the lights and aircon. It seems the CFO had come into the office on the Friday when the managers and his boss had all gone out for a lunch together with the two moaners. You can now see how they had influence and talk with the rest of the office about the conditions and they'd all said that it was awful. He then waited for the bosses to come back and was sitting in the big boss's office. Turns out they'd had a long lunch. He proceeded to get into him about breaking H&S regulations over the lighting and that if two out of 20 didn't like the office, then they had to move, not inflict this situation on everyone else. The aircon was turned on and the lights and the CFO left. The two moaners went straight to the big boss and whined with their manager and were told that nothing could be done for them except that they had to find a different office if they didn't like it. They went on about their rights and the big boss told them it was not up for discussion. The two guys who were responsible for h and for the whole company had come in with the CFO, checked the lighting levels, and they were lower than I'd even thought. We were in serious non-compliance. So when I got called into the meeting with my boss, he was upset because he'd been shouted at by his boss because I'd gone to the h and committee and not through him. I reminded him that I had brought it up verbally and in an email, and he'd emailed back that if I was unhappy, I should move offices. Well, the big boss had thrown my boss and the boss of the two moaners under the bus and said he knew nothing of it. So now my boss was in trouble as the H&S office rep for allowing it to happen when he was supposed to check regulations before making decisions. Whilst I got the lights and aircon back on, it was a small victory. I left three months later. Well, hey, a small victory is a victory nonetheless, and it's a bigger victory for those 17 other workers that may or may not have stayed past those three months. I mean, it's crazy. Two out of 20 people want to change something, 18 people don't, and you change it? That's a strange democracy right there. Dad called me Amber Heard. I found out from my mum that my bio dad called me Amber Heard in a Facebook post because I won't let him meet my child since he abused me my whole life. He's already turned my siblings against me because they still live with him and were too young to remember the worst of it, and I'm the oldest. They don't remember the beatings, the starvation, not having utilities because he spent all our money on drugs and more. Now guys, you know usually that I wanna bring you the most entertaining and often funny entitled parents posts, but I came across this one and I thought I had to share it with you to show that parents like this still exist. And I think this goes beyond entitled. This literally is abusive. The point being, if you have parents like this, first of all, I'm so sorry for you. Second of all, you're not alone and there are other people that unfortunately have parents like this too. All right, next up. My mum wants me to wake up before work and cook for her family. First of all, some important information. My parents immigrated from a country in Central Africa and this sexist mindset is rooted in culture as this is very much how most people live there. This happened a couple of weeks ago. For some background, I am a 15 year old girl and I volunteer at somewhere similar to the YMCA to meet my graduation volunteer hours requirements. For the rest of the story, I'm gonna call it work because it is work. I'm just getting paid in volunteer hours while some my age are getting paid in money. Another thing is I promised my mum I'd cook more this summer because however will I find a husband if I can't cook every dish known to man? I only agreed because she said I couldn't work or volunteer this summer if I didn't. Anyways, on to what happened. My hours are from 10.30 to 4, so I figured it would be best if I came home, shower, then make dinner. The first day was fine, but when I came home on the second day, my mum was annoyed. She didn't even say hello before she scolded me for not making any food that day. I told her I would after I go and shower. She asked what I expected my family of seven, including me, to eat while I was gone. I was dumbfounded, as there are four able-bodied adults in this home who could cook food or order it. Plus, there were some leftovers in the fridge, not to mention snacks. I asked her what she wanted me to do about that since I couldn't leave work early. She told me I should wake up before my shift and cook for the family. Now I was angry. I told her that was ridiculous and that I am a teen, not a mum, and I shouldn't have to wake up early and make food for us. Not to mention when $5 fell out of my pocket at work and I needed lunch, she told me to 
fast or diet. It won't kill you. So I didn't eat anything for my five and a half hour shift. She told me that this was only to prepare me for the future. For when I had my own family, husband and kids to cook for. It's funny how she didn't do this for my brother, who is 18, even though he's going to college after the summer ends, so his future family is closer than mine. Then I said the very thing from her nightmares. Well, thanks for showing me, because I now don't want a husband and kids if this is how I have to suffer. She screamed not to say that, because it might make me infertile, and I said, I don't care. I was then yelled at for saying that. Oh, and by the way, the whole time I was crying a bit from the stress, Oh, frick my life. Okay, yeah, just a simple example of some blatant sexism and controlling parental behavior. What more can I add? Disgusting to see, but it happens. Again, as I do often say, three more years and you're out of there. I guess just hold on till then if you can, OP. Grandma told me I was going to hell at my birthday dinner. This happened years ago at this point, but I just found this up. For some context, my father died when I was very young and he was gay. So my grandmother didn't think he was a good influence or parent Divorce left my mum a single parent, more or less Because my dad really did have a lot going on at the time And wasn't fit to be the sole provider for me So she relied on my grandparents, my father's parents, for a lot Because of this, my mum was very reliant on them for money And usually just let my grandmother have her way about things Something she got her way about until I turned 18 Was that I went to Catholic school I was an altar girl at church, was ordained to give out the Eucharist during mass, the whole shebang. On to the story. I was turning 19 and I just moved home that summer from my first year of college. I couldn't afford a second year there, so I moved home and was enrolling in community college. Since I was home for my birthday, my grandparents offered to take me out for dinner. Diners were always their jam, so I picked one I liked and we go to dinner and we're having a nice time. Then they bring the bill. Grandpa gets up to pay at the counter, as is typical with American diners, and that is when she strikes. Alone at the table with my grandmother for the occasion of my birthday, she proceeds to tell me how disappointed she is that I've stopped going to church. How she feels like I'm wasting the Catholic education she convinced my mother I needed, presumably so I wouldn't turn out gay like my father, and that this deeply saddens her, as I'm surely going to hell as a result. I was stunned. She'd never spoken to me like this before. I don't even know how I responded. I genuinely don't remember. What I do remember is realizing in that moment that nothing I ever accomplished would ever be good enough for her if it didn't include her faith as well. Grandpa came back to the table and she immediately shut up. Grandpa would have never let her say anything like that to me and certainly not at a celebration for my birthday. It was like once I turned 18 and was really finally able to start making decisions for myself, she realized she was losing control of me. I have plenty more stories about her. She's been a constant presence in my life for years. For instance, the time she tricked me into visiting my father's grave. I'm just not sure how well received the grandparent stories are on this sub. Well guys, good news. As you can probably imagine, the comments on Reddit were demanding to hear the grave story. And so OP has obliged. Here is that story. To give you the sure or sweet version, I guess, my dad died when I was 12. When his headstone was ready, grandma wanted everyone to go out to his grave so a priest could bless the stone or something. I didn't want to go. The funeral was traumatic to say the least. The worst way as a kid to be the center of attention is because one of your parents has just died. Anyways, I refused to go. A few weeks later and I'm on summer break and went to my grandparents' house every day while my mum worked. Basically, grandma went and picked up my favorite cousin, took us to get lunch, and instead of going home after lunch, we ended up at the cemetery. I'd never felt so betrayed in my entire life. My aunt, a different aunt than the one who gives me grief for not visiting, ripped my grandma about 16 new buttholes when she found out. Well, I guess that just confirms if we didn't already know that this woman is truly vile. Um, it's as simple as that. You would think that at the age of 12, losing a parent alone would be bad enough, but no. Having your grandma then try and control everything around her and your actions. Wow, unbelievable. Parents feel entitled to choose who I can date or not. I am a 27-year-old woman, and I've been with my 22-year-old boyfriend for six months now. But before that, we were friends for a long while. He was at an exchange program at my university, and we just hit it off. He's basically my best friend. 
I can talk to him about anything and I feel incredibly safe and protected by him. My parents are Muslims. Mum is Asian and dad is Arab. The thing is, he's a recent convert. He converted before we met actually, so entirely his decision. So the chances of my parents being against him is 150% plus. Just the other day, my aunt asked me if I was seeing anyone. I didn't tell her that I was dating or anything of the sort, just that I had a friend I liked. She asked for a picture and I shared it with her. I said I liked him and he likes me, but he's a convert and younger than me. She asked which religion he is from and I said that his parents are Buddhist. I never mentioned his race to her either. She said he was cute, but she's against it because of the age difference. I'm supposed to be the younger one in the relationship. A few days later, while going on a hellish long drive with my mum, she started bringing up topics about women who marry recent converts being cursed, that their children will be born handicapped, their husbands will cheat on them eventually, and that the guys are only converting because of the girl, not for themselves. So the guys will revert back to whatever their original religion was. She kept asking to see my phone and see if I was going out with anyone. She kept accusing me of keeping secrets from her. She proceeded to tell me that my dad dreamt of me being in a bathtub with a black Nigerian man with horns and having my back turned on my parents in the dream. The year before, my dad dreamt I was naked in a hot tub with some ugly fat guy. I don't freaking know. So now my dad's crying because he thinks that the devil has won and made me stray from the path. I was looking for something on my mum's phone, a video. I scrolled down and there it was, my boyfriend's picture in her phone sent by my aunt. I felt betrayed, but I kept quiet. I wanted to see where this was going. Today, my mum told me that she dreamt of a Chinese man wearing all red, bowing before her and bobbing his head. This is so racist, I don't even know what to say anymore. She asked me again, much more sternly this time, am I seeing anyone? I said I like someone. She asked if he had slanted eyes. Racist Asian mum language, is he Chinese? I said yes. How long have you known him, she asked. Two years. You've been keeping that quiet? I told you that I need to screen every single one of your boyfriends. I don't like this guy. He's a convert. He's got slanted eyes and is a lot younger than you. It will never work out. I don't approve of him. No wonder your father's been crying. He was right. She wants me to be with someone of similar age, or he needs to be older than me, come from a line of Muslims, is an original Muslim and is religious, and no Buddhist or Chinese, because they hate Muslims and would do whatever it takes to stray Muslims from the right path. My heart just broke. I don't know. Deep down, I wanted them to be okay with this. I feel betrayed by my aunt. I feel like I'm being trapped by my parents. It's gotten to the point where I might just wait until everyone dies before I start to date openly. I love being with him, but I think he deserves better. I'm fine with being single. I'll be sad, sure, but at least I won't make my parents cry over it. I hate making them sad or disappointing them. I can't move out because in Islam, it's illegal for a woman to live on her own. I also can't just elope or marry my boyfriend if we choose to do so because I need blessings from my parents in order to get married. I'm sorry, my mind is a mess right now. I really don't know how to deal with this situation. This is mainly why I never introduced them to my other boyfriends because I guess deep down, I knew they'd never accept who I choose. So this is pretty disheartening. I'll probably never look for a relationship ever again if this is how the outcome will always be. It's put me off completely. I care about them a lot and I don't want to make them sad. But on the other hand, if I do marry someone they approve of, I'm going to be honest, it would probably be just for them. I probably silently resent my future husband for this and it's not fair. I'll be sad if I marry someone they approve, if I can't choose who I like. They'll be sad if I marry someone they don't approve. It feels like the best way is just to not get married, to be honest. Wow, there we go. That is the end of that one. Another example of parents putting their religion before the interests and happiness of their own child. Look, I'm not religious, as you lot know, but I still will never understand this. Even if I was religious, come on. Does this make sense? You lot that are religious, let me know in the comments. Does this make any sense to you? Putting your religion in front of your child's happiness. How? My pregnant ex keeps trying to move into my apartments. This is not my story. This is my friend's story that I'm posting for him because he doesn't have a Reddit account and he wants people to hear about this. Also for convenience, I'm gonna write this in first person because pronouns are hard to keep up with. Everything here is approved by my friend. So I am a 21 year old man and I have an ex, Angelica, who is 20. Angelica and I had an on and off relationship since we were about 15. 
but we got serious when covid hit and i had to move back to my hometown we got an apartment together and very soon after she started spending a lot of time with her cousin long story short she's screwing her cousin we break up we've been broken up for nine months at this point for seven of those months her phone has been on my phone bill and she owes me over 500 dollars fine whatever i'll never see that 500 dollars and she always makes excuses to pay me back that's life it's my own fault for letting her keep using me as a cash cow she also took my car when we broke up and i let her because i was too afraid she'd try and take my apartment too anyway it's nine months past our breakup and i get this message hey i'm pregnant i'm on my way home from work so i don't respond that is nine months past being my problem it's not my baby she messages me again my boyfriend the one she cheated on me with and i have nowhere to stay still nine months past my problem now angelica has never worked a day in her life she lives off the disability check from her boyfriend and spends it 99 percent on weed and fast food she never paid rent and is documented to never pay rent anyway she tells me my name is still on the lease we're gonna move in in september i tell her your name is not on the lease it was renewed last month and i took your name off i'm sorry she messages me calling me a jerk and saying she's moving in because she has nowhere for her baby and three dogs to stay mind you my apartment is more like a studio and barely fits me let alone two other people and three dogs so i tell her it's not happening i'm moving out of town soon anyway Also, come and pick up your stuff that you left at my apartment nine months ago. She says no, and that if I throw it away, she's going to press charges. I tell her it doesn't matter, because when I move, I'm throwing it away. She later called my landlord and told him I was planning on moving out. I got upset at this and told her I ran the numbers on the car, and it's still in my name. So, get the car out of my name now, or I'm repossessing it or she can just leave me the frick alone she started bawling on a call asking how i could do this to her and her unborn child and that i was condemning her and her child to be homeless she also still has a gun in my name that i told her to give back or i'm calling the cops i'm really considering repossessing the car since it was mine from the start and is still in my name she doesn't deserve to get a free car handed to her she needs to wake up she keeps saying she needs a place to stay that i'm ruining her and her baby's life It's literally my apartment that she's never once paid rent on. I don't know how she thinks she's entitled to just live in my apartment with the guy she cheated on me with and three dogs. I hope the baby ends up okay. It's not its fault its mother is a spoiled brat, but I also hope being homeless and careless wakes her the frick up. Yeah, OP, you've got the right mindset here, but you need to go further. I mean, come on. Why are you still paying for her stuff? she cheated on you nine months ago and you're still paying for her phone bill she's still using your car come on dudes grow a backbone what you're saying here is all good and well but you should have done this nine months ago and you need to do it now women try to get my 14 year old and seven year old sisters arrested for taking out the trash this happened today while me a 20 year old woman my mum, who is 39 and my two sisters 14 and 7 were cleaning out our yard for context we live in a smaller older looking house on a relatively gentrified street with a lot of small to medium sized but high-end apartment buildings it's still the same neighborhood despite them being three to five story buildings with underground parking so we have two big metal dumpsters in the neighborhood One at the start of the neighborhood and one near the end. We live near the middle of the neighborhood. So my mum decided to just request a private bin from the government to place outside our own gate so as to not have to walk too much to throw away our trash when we're busy. Well, let's just say that after five years of rough treatment from the government waste collection company, it gave its last service and we had to request a replacement, which would take a few days. In the meantime, we had to take turns walking to the dumpsters on either side of our neighborhood to throw away the trash. It's never a problem and shouldn't be because it's all of our taxes that pay for waste collection anyway. My mum sent both of my sisters to throw a bag of yard cuttings to any of the dumpsters and they decided to go to the one near the start of the neighborhood for once. It's all right. My mum says okay and stays near the gate to keep an eye on them while I continue to clean the porch. A few minutes later, I can hear my mum start yelling then running in the direction that my sisters went in and i nearly died thinking something horrible happened so i followed her at the start of the neighborhood were my sisters near the dumpster that was off to the side of the building and a woman was full-on screaming at them from her second floor balcony 
with her husband just watching from the sliding door. I couldn't hear what the woman was saying as of yet, but I did hear when my mum started tearing the lady a new one from in front of my sister's when she got there. My mum is a bit of a hothead, and while I am too, she tends to make irrational decisions more, and her English begins to slip. It's her second language, which makes it hard to get her point across or understood. So as usual, I walk up and take over and tell her to calm down while I deal with the Karen. My mum was pulled back by my sisters to the other side of the road, and I looked up to look at the dumbass on the second floor. What in the world are you saying, mom? You can't throw your trash here. I'm gonna give you the freaking trash collection bill. Mom, this is a public neighborhood dumpster. I pay to live in this neighborhood and for this trash collection. You can't throw your stuff in there unless you pay for it to be picked up. At this point, I'm utterly confused. Is she stupid and couldn't see the big fat government stamp painted on all sides of the dumpster? Mom, we live in this neighborhood too. She then makes the mistake of ignoring me and looking towards my sisters on the other side of the street and begins to yell her head off. Both of you take the trash you threw out of the dumpster now, now, or I'm calling the freaking police. My sisters are seven and 14. She wanted to call the police on them which immediately set my mum off again. I was quite irritated. My mum shouted back, Shut up! I'm their mum. You talk to me or you haul butt back into your apartment. At this point, I say to mum, Ma, go home. But this lady is just absolutely screaming and pulls out her cell phone, repeating that she's going to call the police and make us pay for trash collection. I immediately lose my patience. Call them then. Get it over with. Call them and tell them that you want them to arrest a 14-year-old and seven-year-old for throwing trash in the dumpster. The lady seemed taken aback, but began directing this at me again. I'll have them lock you all up. You're polluting the neighborhood and dumping trash when you don't pay for the service. Take the trash out of the dumpster before I come break all your faces. You don't pay the waste company either. Call the police and tell them all of this. Do it before I do. That made her husband finally step in, and he pulled her back into the apartment while she still screamed. He came outside by himself while we heard crashing and slamming inside the apartment. The husband said, You don't have to take the trash back out of the dumpster. Just don't do it again. But that made me even more irritated, and I took a few deep breaths. Why can't I throw trash here? In the public neighborhood dumpsters, funded by my tax dollars just the same as it's funded by yours. This man had the audacity to snore and shake his head. I know about your people, sweetheart. Don't lie to us. It clicked as to what the frick both of them were insinuating. You piece of absolute sh**. Do not pretend to know anything about me or my family whatsoever. Keep in mind that this is at like 10 a.m. on a Monday and the street was not empty. So the few people going about their business had been stunned by the argument and a neighbor had already called the police about a public disturbance. The police drive a huge expensive Ford truck that they spend all their money on to get because of course they did. This is a developing country after all. And boy, did that whole story that me, my family, the crazy woman and her husband, and a few neighbors had to recount did not go well for the crazy Karen. Especially when they had to step into the apartment building manager's office to review the security footage, which made it go even worse for the crazy lady and her husband because the apartment manager was appalled and didn't say a single word to anyone other than the police until she slipped aside and called the owner of the building. Let's just say that my 14 and 7 year old sisters did not end up taking an air conditioned ride in the backseat of the police Ford to the station to be charged with threats against a minor and public disturbance and neither did they get an immediate eviction notice for breaking of their lease agreement while their wife went off to solidify her criminal record screaming at police officers people really be back crazy nowadays and there we go that is the end of that one i'm not entirely sure exactly what this woman's rationale was the entire time it wasn't explicitly stated but my inkling is that it was probably racism you didn't say where you're from the country you're from or your skin color but that is the way it kind of sounded which is just horrible to hear i've got to say that you did handle that extremely well calming your mum down being logical the whole time being relatively calm yourself i mean obviously you got pretty irate but who wouldn't in that situation and getting a good outcome so fair play to you for keeping it cool as much as you could i would never been able to do that boyfriend's dad is lucky we didn't call the cops disclaimer i'm not advocating for violence i'm just pointing out how lucky my boyfriend's dad is that i don't currently own a firearm because i genuinely thought that we were experiencing a home invasion two things are important to know about me 
I am hard of hearing, and I am a survivor of a violent crime and subsequent stalking. For some context, my boyfriend, who is 28, and his folks in their late 60s own a coffee shop. But because his dad doesn't want to A, listen to anyone else, B, learn how to run a business correctly, or C, pay his son his draw, my boyfriend is largely uninvolved and has talked about being bought out. He is still the administrator on the point of sale system though, because his dad has no desire to actually learn how it works or go through the process to take over the accounts. The coffee shop drama could be a whole series of posts about how they did us dirty, perhaps another time. We got to bed really late, okay, early. It was 4.30 a.m., which normally wouldn't be an issue as my boyfriend was scheduled for a late shift and I'm currently taking time off work to figure out a medical issue. My boyfriend turns off his phone volume when he goes to bed and this is well known to everyone close to us. He's notoriously hard to get a hold of in the mornings. I only hear my phone if it's right under my pillow and the volume and vibration is up. At 6.25 a.m., I started receiving the following texts from my boyfriend's mum, which I do not hear as I'm past the freck out. Sorry to bother you. I need your boyfriend to call his dad ASAP. His phone is off. Then at 7.35 a.m., she texts, My husband is going to come and wake you guys unless he calls us. Just before 8.30, the dogs start barking as someone tried to open the locked bedroom door. I wake up panicked as whoever it is starts banging on the door. It then stops for a few moments, then starts again. No one has said anything at this point. Not me, not my boyfriend, not the intruder. I get up and go to the closet for the baseball bat and start kicking myself for thinking we wouldn't need a gun when my boyfriend had brought it up in the past. We open the bedroom door to find my boyfriend's entitled dad at the end of the hall. He starts yelling about needing the code for the two-factor authentication for the register. I start yelling at him and my boyfriend, who is just as angry as I am. Has me go back into the bedroom, I put my hearing aids in at this point. His dad claims to have been knocking on our front door, but neither dog heard him. My boyfriend gives him the code, tries to explain to him that coming into our house unannounced is a huge violation of trust and boundaries, not the first major issue. His dad then yells about needing to get the register working. My boyfriend kicks him out and we think that's the end of it. Not two minutes later, I receive another text from my boyfriend's mum. Please tell my son to send the new code. We still can't get in. Then we hear the clanging of the metal gate and more pounding on the front door. We go answer it and my boyfriend's dad is yelling again about needing the new code and he has a copy of our key in hand. He clearly was going to let himself back in. I lost it at this point and yelled, you can't just let yourself into our house. What the frick is wrong with you? He gave me more BS about needing to get the register working. I screamed, my ability to be safe in my own home is more important than your shop. He took particular offense at this, yelling back at me, So you see me as a threat? Am I a threat to you? I try explaining that I've had my home broken into before. His response, not by me, over and over, then continues yelling about the shop. I demand the emergency key back, and after yelling a bit more, he shoves it at me. My boyfriend's had enough and yells at me to go back to the bedroom. He'll handle it. I do, because at this point, I'm on the edge of a panic attack. Through the closed bedroom door, I hear more yelling, and after a bit, the door slams. My boyfriend called his mum, saying that his dad needed to apologise, and that this behaviour was not acceptable. She asked him, what does he need to apologise for? My boyfriend tells her what happened, and she is mortified. I then get this text from her. At 9.08am, I'm sorry to have bothered you so much today and I'm sorry my husband made such a scene. I haven't responded. This man clearly doesn't understand boundaries. He doesn't think he needs to be held accountable for anything and felt entitled to just barge into our house and demand his son fix a tech issue. And for the record, yes, I do in fact see him as a threat now. Both of my boyfriend's parents know about my severe PTSD. We know he won't apologize because he genuinely doesn't see a problem with his behavior. It's time for some serious boundaries and a security system. Honestly, what is wrong with people like this? Emergency keys are emergency keys for a reason. If they're going to abuse it, even if they're your boyfriend's dad or parent, I don't care. If they're going to abuse it, change the locks. Simple as that. Well, you got the key back, which is one step. But hey, who knows? They might have made another copy. They're so weird. 
Like, why is this such a pressing issue as well? Honestly, weird, weird parents. I mean, he literally did break and enter, and that surely is illegal. So if you want to press charges, go ahead. Maybe it's a bit petty, but wow, it's an option. Smug Karen takes my car keys because I can't possibly be the owner, earns herself a ride in the backseat of one of our county's finest. This is just a throwaway because I don't care to stick around for long. But this incident was so stupid that I can't really help but share the story since my friends keep telling me to. What I find most weird about this is that my car wasn't anything super special. It was just a yellow 09 V6 Chevy Camaro with black stripes. When I bought it, it was super cheap because the passenger side door had been smashed in somehow and there was already 130,000 miles on the odometer. But the title was still good somehow. No idea why, nor do I really care. It was sold to me via a proxy. All I know was the car looked like a good deal, so I bought it. A friend of mine who works in auto body fixed it for me. He said that most of the damage was to the door itself, and I just needed a new door after he made a few tweaks to make sure everything was straight. Together, we managed to find a door at a salvage yard that was the same color. A little work, and the car looked almost new and it became my fun ride to commute to work or drive around when I didn't feel like using my other car. I didn't do any modifications to it. I'm not one of those guys that's into speed or crazy mods. I like the car because it looked cool and the gas mileage wasn't so bad with the V6. In fact, I wanted a V6 Camaro because I heard that they're usually in better condition than ones with a V8 because people drive the V6 more for looks than power and don't gas it as much. I drove that Camaro for a year before running into a random Karen at a supermarket last year in September. Those places tend to draw Karens in regularly, especially in the state I live in. I've seen many Karens, but I was lucky enough to hardly ever be noticed by them. I was shopping for some stuff to make dinner and was about to head home when I found the Karen with her young son all over my car after exiting the store. I'm guessing the boy was around four years old and his mother was taking pictures of the kid sitting on my hood while the kid kept smiling and gleefully saying, Bumblebee. Yes, I understand the reference and I've heard it all before, but I don't like people messing with my property, so I told the kid to get off. The Karen took one look at me and told me to mind my own business. Now, I'm a 29-year-old man, but I do have a bit of a baby face, and my casual clothing made me look like a teenager. So, I guess to her, I couldn't possibly be someone who'd have anything to do with such a nice car that's actually a pretty common car. I told the Karen to get off my Camaro, and she bluntly told me there was no way it was my car because I'm too young. I pulled out my keys and hit the alarm button on the remote. That made the alarm start blaring for a second and her kid jumped off while screaming and crying because I'd frightened him. But rather than pay attention to her crying child, the Karen came running at me full speed and managed to shove me hard enough that I fell over. The next part is a bit hazy. I got a bump on the head and that crazy idiot slurred every word she was screaming at me. She stepped on my arm and pulled the keys from my hand before I really had a chance to react though she didn't really hurt me much. She wasn't a big woman, only around five foot two or so, and a twig, while I'm six foot and over 170 pounds. When I got to my feet, she was comforting her crying kid and telling him that I was a mean person. I told her to return my keys, but she got hissy and said there was no way the Kamara was mine. I again stated it was, and I'd only give her one more chance to return my keys. She didn't. Instead, she handed them to her kid, who proceeded to start playing with the buttons on the remote and unlock the doors. I had enough and got my phone out to call the police. When the Karen saw I was on my phone, she started screaming and charging at me again, though this time I easily dodged her and she nearly fell on the asphalt and screamed that I'd assaulted her. I never even touched her and I said as much out loud. The 911 operator was listening to everything that was going on and I quickly told her where we were while this insane woman was still screaming at me and two police cars showed up before long. At this point, the Karen had locked herself in my car with her son and started the engine to run the AC. I explained everything to the police and they knocked on the window of my Camaro to get the Karen to open it and give them her side of the story. She claimed the car to be hers and that I was just some stupid broke teenager that tried to carjack her, then bragged that she'd taken me down. The officer asked if that meant she'd shoved me over, to which she bluntly said yes. I told the police to look in my glove compartment. In there, of course, was my insurance card and a copy of my registration, and they could compare the name on my license. When the Karen heard that, she got out of the car and finally admitted it wasn't hers. But she then said there was no way it could be mine, and that she just took the keys from me to find the real owner. 
That quickly earned her some shiny new bracelets and she was put screaming into the back of a police car. The parking lot had cameras, so proving assault was easy. Though I only really got scratches, a bruise on my arm where she stepped on it and a small bump on the head. After the Karen was taken back to the station, they found she was high on drugs, which explains why she was so nuts. I of course pressed charges, though my testimony wasn't really needed since the police had both CCTV from the parking lot and the audio from my phone call. And it turned out to be the Karen's third offense and she got two years in prison. Oh, and her kid was taken from her. The whole incident made me rethink owning the Camaro because it had been a magnet for people that bothered me a lot. So I sold it. I basically got back everything I had into it anyway, so I broke even. I doubt I'll want to own another sports car again. You know, this is something that I'm surprised I don't see more of on this subreddit. Karens or entitled people that are just on drugs. Because that is the only way often that I can understand some of their behavior. Now, Opie has said in the comments in a little edit underneath this post that he found out she was high and found out that her kid was taken away from her due to the court. Just because he didn't have to testify doesn't mean he wasn't there in his own words. So yeah, I guess it all adds up. Um, mental that you'd even think about being on drugs when your kid is nearby, but maybe she's addicted. I don't know. Ultimately, it's just really sad, isn't it? Entitled parent and child try to make my high school paint over a student's memorial. Okay, so a bit of context for this story. At the start of each school year, my high school's new seniors get assigned a parking space for the rest of the year. Once you're assigned your spots, it's a fun rite of passage to paint it, which the school provides the paint for and gives a day of class for all seniors to go and paint. This tradition has been going on for four years now. Three years ago, a senior student in my school was killed in a car crash along with her younger brother and mum. Her painted car park reads, This is Jane's car park. The best go in the world. Back off and has tons of gorgeous flowers painted on it. After she passed away, all of the seniors from her year wrote beautiful messages to her on her car park in Sharpie. Since then, whoever was assigned her spot has never painted over it. It's an unspoken rule that if you get her park, you simply go and help someone else paint theirs for the day. This story takes place at the start of the year around March, which is when Australian students start their school year. In the first week of school, the rest of the senior cohort and I received our car park allocations. I was given the park two spots down from Jane's, which is how I know what went down. So it was car park painting day. All the seniors headed down to the school's park and went about finding our spots, which have little numbers in front of them, like A1, A2, etc. I find mine pretty quickly and go about sketching out my design in chalk. A few minutes later, I hear someone swearing beside me. I look up and see Liam standing over Jane's spot, complaining loudly about having to park in the dead girl spot and that he was going to be cursed. I roll my eyes but ignore him and he leaves. Until a few minutes later when he comes back with paint. Now, I actually knew Jane for the first two years of high school as she was in my role marking class. So there was no way I was gonna let someone paint over her memorial. I stand up and walk over to Liam, who's struggling to get the lid off of the paint tin. I figure that maybe he just isn't aware of the unspoken rule, so I stand in Jane's park and gesture to his paint tin. Nah, we don't paint over Jane's spot, I say. It's just kind of an unwritten rule out of respect. But Liam looks up at me and scoffs dismissively. Nah, he says. I was assigned this spot to paint, so I'm gonna paint it. It's been ages since she died. The boy on the other side of him looks over and shakes his head and says, don't paint it, dude. That's messed up. But Liam ignores him and continues trying to get the lid off the paint. A lot of people are listening in now and the girl in the spot behind him goes and fetches a teacher. The teacher takes Liam aside and tells him that he isn't allowed to paint over Jane's memorial and that he can be reassigned to the one remaining parking spots. Liam refuses, saying that the available spot is at a really awkward angle to park in. It isn't and he wants Jane's. The teacher says okay, but no painting. Liam comes back and sits on the side of the park, grumbling. I considered offering him my spot as I'm terrible at painting anyway, but I decided he didn't deserve it. Cut to two days after the incident. I get to school early as I'm doing volunteer hours in the uniform shop. As I'm folding, I overhear two admin staff talking about the crazy lady that barged her way into the principal's office yesterday morning. It turns out that Liam's mum came all the way down to school just to chew out the principal for not letting her son paint his park and that they have another meeting scheduled for the next day. Wow, crazy I think, but I don't pay it too much mind. Two days later, I'm called into the principal's office in the first period. I walk in and I see the principal at his desk. 
but Liam, his entitled mother, and the boy who told Liam not to paint the park are also all in the room. The principal greets me and I stand somewhat awkwardly by the door as there are no remaining seats. Opie and Jake, the principal gestures to me and the boy. We're here today to talk about the events on Monday. Liam and his mum are saying that you two tried to get physical with him when he wanted to paint his park. Jake and I look at each other and both give an awkward half laugh. Sir, he starts. We didn't go anywhere. N- I know what you two did. The entitled mother cuts him off. We all look at her in surprise. The principal says, if you could just let Jake finish his sentence. Are you trying to tell me you don't believe my son? Of course they're going to say they didn't do it. It's two against one. She squawks. There were lots of other students that day who I'm sure. No, they all hate my boy. It's because of his race. They single him out. Now, something really important to note here is that Liam is white. I am white. The principal is white. His mum is white. Now, Jake is black, but this is a predominantly white school. We all sit there in silence. The entire mum huffing and puffing while Liam has gone very red. The principal pauses, then tells Jake to finish recounting his story. Jake explains what happened, and I back him up. The mother makes snide comments throughout, but we all ignore her. The principal thanks us and tells us we can go, despite the entire mum's protests, and that he'll be asking the teacher on duty what happened. Now, I wish I could update on what happened afterwards, but neither Jake or I really know. We were never called back into the office, and Jane's parking spot remains the same. Liam now uses the spot that he previously declined, but interestingly, he never chose to paint it. Jake and I talked about it a few weeks after being called into the office, and he said that the school called his parents to inform them about the meeting, but the school never reached out to mine. Some good did come of this though. Jake and I started talking, and he asked me to be his date to our formal in a few weeks. I said yes. First of all, before we even get into how entitled this mum and her son are, that's a really cool tradition and I love that it's still ongoing even to this day. I mean, the painting of the parking spots alone is a fantastic idea and the fact that you've left Jane's Park as it was, lovely touch. Now we get onto this kid. Uh, uh, Brain cells, my brother. Where where have they gone? And then we get onto his mum, who's uh, even worse. I mean, mental. A little bit of understanding and, and just compassion would be great for a girl, a student, that's died. I'll never understand entitled people. You're confusing my kids. I was wearing pants. I am a 24 year old woman and I live in the part of Ontario, Canada with a heavy Mennonite population. If you don't know what Mennonite is, think a mild version of Amish. Some will dress very modestly, causing visitors from outside Ontario to mistake them for Amish type A. Others will dress more modern, but still remain modest. No shoulder showing and women wore pants type B. I am not Mennonite at all, outside of my legal middle name after my mum's best friend, who is type B Mennonites. I live downtown at the heart of Mennonite Central, so I will occasionally go to the restaurants that are there. Mennonite food is much better than a lot of the stuff served at the grocery store or a regular chain restaurants. One day, when I was 22, while waiting for my food as I was on my way somewhere, I was scrolling my phone looking at memes. Suddenly, a type A Mennonite approached me. Excuse me, miss? I put my phone in my pocket and looked over. Sorry, am I in your way? No, you need to go and change into something more appropriate. I was confused. Do I have a hole in my pants? I should buy new pants. That's the problem. You're wearing pants. Now I'm even more confused. Sorry? You're confusing my kids. They thought you were a boy who refused to cut his hair. I look at my hair. I am due for a haircut, but so what does my hair have to do with your complaint? Your outfit is confusing my kids. They're gonna think it's okay for girls to wear pants. Now I'm getting annoyed. Look, I'm not Mennonites. That's all you need to know. More and more girls in this town are wearing pants and shorts. I don't even own a dress. Now, if you don't mind, I need to eat this and get to where I need to go before this gets ugly. My order gets called and I grab my food. I go to leave when the woman grabs me. Your parents should be ashamed of you for leaving the church. I hope they shunned you. My parents aren't men and I either. Now let me go, please. Not until you... Her husband thankfully pulls her off me. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Have a good day, miss. Thanks, you too. I left the restaurant and ate my food. I know this isn't very climactic, but I only remembered this story when I showed up the other day to get a sandwich from them. It makes me wonder if they were new to the area or they don't go into town often. 
Once again, I feel like I say this with a lot of entitled parent stories that I see on this subreddit that are based on religion. It's okay to be religious and, and follow whatever sort of religion you want to do. It's your choice and that's absolutely fine. But the problems start to arise when you start pushing your religion onto other people that have nothing to do with it and want nothing to do with it. That is too far. As we saw here, OP is not a Mennonite, therefore they can wear what they want. That should be obvious. Apparently it's not. Parents prefer incest over me being happy. I am a 21 year old man and I've been in a surprisingly successful relationship for the past year and a half, ever since I moved to Europe to start my studies. I honestly didn't think I'd hold it together this long, but hey, the girl actually likes me. Shocker. She's honestly perfect. Spiritually, she is a neckbeard and I love her for it. My parents though, not so much. Not because of her personality. They don't care about little things like that. She's European and that's the problem. My parents belong to a minority in the Middle East. We believe in a lot of things, but the kicker is that if you marry outside your faith, you get excommunicated. Disowned, not allowed back in the village, the whole Shazam. And since there's so few of us, privileges are handed out so that finding the love of your life would still be possible. Dude down the street, Arda Child, it's fine. We'll just introduce my daughter to him. I'm sure he's a good man. Son fell in love with your niece. Ah, oh, it's fine. Mads of the heart are complicated. Your daughter fell in love with an Englishman after eight years of living in England? Burn her at the stake. I feel like my mum genuinely thought that I was going to move back home to the village and meet someone there, like she and her siblings did. But surprise, surprise, I wasn't a fan of it, especially since her siblings consist of her sister, who married a man 20 years younger than her, her brother, who married his cousin, and her other brother, who's on his third marriage with a woman who can only be described as a vanilla flavored biscuit. Ever since I got into a relationship, my parents have been relatively supportive. I feel like my mum was just glad I'm not gay, since I wasn't like the other boys in high school. And my dad, in true dad fashion, was just happy I was getting some. One and a half years later, they started showing their concern. My dad regularly sits me down for talks about our heritage and my mom regularly jokes about setting me up with a future bride whenever i bring up something remotely serious about my girlfriend they get visibly upset i'm in a position right now where i possibly have to move cities the fact that i want to stay where i am because i'm not exactly enthusiastic about leaving my girlfriend and the life i've built here caused them to short circuit all of a sudden my poor academic performance wasn't due to my many mental health problems or covid or just my lack of interest in the subject it was the witch the witch who seduced me and led me astray because their golden boy is definitely incapable of making poor decisions himself so yeah it got to a point where they're trying their hardest to force me to move cities just to get away from my girlfriend they're arguing about it every phone call now and if i just give it time they're gonna add the financial pressure on top of that that's fun i just really hope they mellow out soon if not for me for my siblings sakes I'm the oldest, so I get the brunt of the generational friction, but I only hope it gets better when they get older. Okay, let me get this straight. Your parents are literally advocating an ingrown family tree. That is very normal, first of all. Second of all, biologically, that can't be good. And thirdly, just don't talk to them again and do what makes you happy. I mean, I would have thought that most parents have their children's happiness in their interest, but clearly not. Again, very strange. I get that it's a, a cultural thing, but... To this extent, incest? Nah. Entitled lady tries to challenge a semi with her vehicle. I always thought that a lot of these entitled people stories in this thread are false and made up. Today, I was proven wrong. Entitled people do exist. So I drive a semi for a living, delivering pallets of merchandise to local stores. Local roads aren't easy to maneuver with 18 wheelers, so oftentimes I took up a lot of space whenever I tried to make a turn. Most drivers are nice and understanding though. They usually move out of the way or back up to give me some room without hesitation, and some even drove out of their corner street parking spot and parked in another spot just so I could use their space to make a tight turn. Lots of nice drivers. However, today I met the rare unsung hero that made this story possible. This morning, I was driving on a single lane, two-way road, and I needed to make a right turn at the end of the street so I could make my first delivery, which is a couple yards away from the T-junction. The T-junction has a stop sign only for my lane, so it's quite a dangerous turn since the incoming traffic doesn't need to stop. The street I'm turning into is a double lane, two-way road, but there's a construction at the corner of the road, occupying the right lane. That means I have to swing wide, taking up the left lane of the other way so I don't cause an accident in the construction zone. So, as soon as I saw that both ways were clear, I made the turn carefully. Some vehicles came last minute from the other way, but they saw the construction and understood, and all of them moved to their right lane, giving me space. 
all but one. This lady came up from the other way to the front of my truck before I finished making the turn, forcing me to perform sudden braking, which she does as well. Then she was pressing hard on her horn. She then started yelling something that I couldn't understand, mostly because she was still honking, but also because our windows are rolled up. She's inching closer to my truck that's at a standstill while gesturing me to move out of the way. Her turn signal is on, indicating that she's about to turn left. I just gestured to her as well, shrugging my shoulders, making sure she knows, like, what am I supposed to do? I can't back up. There's another truck behind me waiting for me to finish my turn. If I back up, I'll hit the truck with my trailer tail. Mind you, it only takes me a few seconds to complete the turn and there are no cars behind her because apparently other drivers understood to at least give a truck some space to finish a turn, especially when the roads are tight. I also saw some vehicles turning behind me from their right lane, so there's no excuse that this Karen of a driver can't do the same. By now, she was honking probably for a full minute, refusing to reverse. This caught the attention of the construction workers. Also, this causes a traffic jam from the left side of the T-junction and also behind me. People were furious, but she wouldn't move. One of the construction workers told the lady to just move back and give me some room to finish my turn, but she wouldn't budge. She just yelled something at him while still pressing on her horn. After a while, I had enough of her. I released my brakes and I started to inch closer towards her. I had no intention of causing any damage. I just hoped that she'd get scared by my threat and move backwards. What do you know? It worked. Her eyes widened. She panicked for a bit, switched her gear shift to reverse and started moving backwards. I didn't give her any room to move forward again. I just kept inching forward while she was moving backwards until I saw that my trailer was safe to finish the turn. Then I'm back to my own lane. Karen gave me a death glare, but I did the same to her. I also stick my tongue out to her because why not? Then the most hilarious thing happens. From my side mirror, I saw the construction workers clapping and cheering for me. Also, the truck behind me also made their turn, giving Karen no space to move forward again. Then the vehicles on the left side of the T-junction just kept going, not letting Karen make her turn. It was glorious. I made it to my delivery about five minutes late, but it was totally worth it. So this woman was literally playing chicken with a semi. Uh, How stupid do you have to be? Even if you're the one in the right in this situation, you just get out the way. What are you going to do in your car? Even if you've got like an SUV or something, you're up against a semi. Uh, What? I mean, the best part about the story, as you said at the end, is the fact that everyone involved in this incident or just watching on, including the construction workers, knew that you were in the right. But this woman, oh God, just what a disgrace to humanity. Disowned daughter passed away from stress. So my mother has been and continues to make my life less than enjoyable. One particular thing I want to get off my chest is what happened when I was 12. I have or had twin sisters who were 15 at the time. Their names are Sarah and Bess. Our mum left our dad to be with a total idiot of a man. This man would buy food and put his name on it so that we couldn't eat it. He grabbed me by my neck for walking out of the kitchen with food in my mouth called us horrible names all the while my mum knew obviously we were never allowed to tell our father what was happening our mum would tell us what happens in my house stays in my house your dad doesn't need to know and you better not tell him one night Bess had enough of my mum's new man and called our dad my mum listened in on another phone this is back in the good old 90s after she heard Bess confiding in our dad about what was going on my mum was furious she told Bess she was no longer her daughter told her the sight of her face made her sick banished her to her room completely besides using the toilets. This went on for about one to two weeks. Well, all the stress from everything triggered a heart condition we didn't know Bess had to flare up and she actually went into cardiac arrest one morning and died. Dead at 15. My mum will never admit to the past, has never made things right, acts as if it never happened. I recently went no contact with her, and if you read another of my posts, you'll see why. I have never healed from this. I mean, wow, what a tragic way to start this episode. That is just downright depressing. The fact that your mum still hasn't taken ownership of the situation she caused after so many years is just downright abusive. I cannot believe she's acted this way, and I'm so, so sorry for your loss. Karen nearly attacked me because of a shirt. So, recently, I, a 30-year-old woman, went on vacation. While on vacation, I stopped at a couple of those wacky tourist shops. You know, the ones filled with crazy shot glasses and t-shirts. While in one of them, the cashier was wearing a shirt that said, Not today, Karen. I told her I thought the shirt was funny, and she then tells me that they sell the shirt in the store. I, of course, rushed to buy one. Fast forward a couple of days, and I'm back home from my vacation. I decided to go out for dinner instead of cooking, so I tossed on some clothes and headed to my favorite sushi place. I hadn't realized until I got there that I tossed on my new Not Today Karen t-shirts. 
Honestly, I didn't think anything would happen because, come on, it's a t-shirt. But I was wrong. I go in, eat my fill of yummy sushi, and leave. As I'm heading to my car, I hear someone dramatically gasp in shock and then say loudly, How dare you? I turn to see what's going on, only to be met with a Karen marching right up to me, dragging her, I'd say, four-year-old looking daughter with her. She was the typical Karen, from her haircut to her overly priced, ill-fitting clothes. This bleach blonde menace gets right up in my face and starts shouting at me, How dare you wear such an offensive shirt? That is a racist term. You might as well be wearing a shirt with the N-word on it. Mind you, she didn't say the N-word, but the actual word with a hard R. Her daughter started wailing because her mother was screaming. And I kind of think because every time I took a step back, trying to avoid the literal spit flying from her mouth, she would sharply step forward, jerking the kid with her. As soon as she noticed her daughter crying, she started screaming about how I'm scaring her with my offensive shirt. She just kept going on and on, getting louder with every word. You should be ashamed of yourself. She jabbed her finger at me and started shouting about how people like you should be arrested for hate crimes. I rolled my eyes and turned to leave. I was full of sushi and honestly, I couldn't care less about her BS. I barely took a step forward when I was shoved from behind and nearly fell over. Don't you dare walk away from me, you dog. I readjusted myself, walked up in her face and said calmly, Touch me again and see what happens. She backed up and started shouting about how dare I threaten her and her daughter. I said she's the one who shoved me and if she tried that again, she would regret it. She started screaming about how I assaulted her and her daughter. Someone call the police. Apparently, Karen didn't know that the sushi shop I was just in is a local favorite of the police. There were two officers in there eating and they both witnessed the whole thing. I'm also a bit buddy buddy with the police that frequent the sushi place because one of my close family friends is an officer and he always talked about me like I was his kid. Also, whenever I go there, I usually help pay for their meals as a thank you for their service. One of the officers in there recognized me and came out. As soon as Karen saw them, she ran up to them, again dragging her poor wailing child with her and said I'd assaulted her and was calling her horrible racist terms. The one cop, I'll call her Marge, walks over to me and asks me what started it. Now, Marge and I somewhat know each other. Her training officer was my family friend and the two were as close of friends as he was with my family. I told her what happened and had to explain the whole Karen joke with her. She laughed, told me I could go and that she would handle it. I thanked her and turned to leave. As soon as Karen noticed I was leaving, she screamed louder, saying, how dare you let that dog get away with a hate crime? I left without any more fuss. I'm not sure what happened to Karen. I'm sure the next time I see Mars, she'll let me know. I can't believe that I got attacked by a Karen over a shirt. Now guys, a question. Would you wear a t-shirt that says not today Karen? Because I think I would. And I think although it would encourage more interactions like this one, it would be quite fun. What do you reckon? Should I release one? I can make one. It'll be good. I've got a merch store, as you guys know. Would you like to see that shirt on my store? I can make it pretty sick. Let me know down below. Entitled Mum was unhappy that I didn't choose an equal number of boy and girl volunteers, despite needing an odd number. I was reminded of this today when it popped up in my Facebook memories. I think it fits here. I used to work for a children's science company. One of the things we did was I was paid by the local water company to write a show teaching children about the importance of saving water and ways to do this. It was a 45 to 60 minute show featuring a lot of big over-the-top experiments to both entertain and educate the kids. The whole show was funded by the water company, so the schools get a free show. As such, every school wanted the show and we were performing multiple shows every day for a solid few months. Anyway, enough backstory. Myself and my colleague were at a school performing the water show, teaching the kids about the importance of saving water in our own inimitable, irreverent way. The school had invited parents into the assembly, so we had about 30 or so parents seated at the back of the hall. After the show, which went down an absolute treat, a parent came up to speak to me. My colleague had gone to take some equipment to the car, so it was just myself. This was the entitled mum of this story. Hello, do you mind if I have a quick word? Of course not. Well, let me start off by telling you how fantastic that show was. I was already waiting for the but. Thank you very much. But my internal monologue 
There it is. I was wondering if you'd noticed that you picked more boys than girls as your volunteers rather than an equal number of each. You're asking me if I realized that I didn't pick an equal number of boys and girls as my volunteers. Yes. Yes, I was aware of this, mainly because we need an odd number of volunteers in the show. It's very difficult to keep the numbers equal when the total number is odd. The entitled mum looks at me while trying to think. Did you notice that while we picked four boys and two girls for the aquifer experiments, we picked a girl as the solo volunteer for the toothbrushing experiments? And the toothbrushing volunteer does a lot more than the aquifer volunteers do. So yesterday, when we did this exact same show in a different school, we had four girls and two boys for the aquifer experiments, and then a boy for the toothbrush. We always try and keep things as fair as possible. Well, I'm just saying because my daughters were here today and I want them to enjoy science. Well, hopefully they did. I also noticed that on your banner, she indicates a pop-up banner off to one side, you have two boys and one girl on that that's hardly equal true but with the size of the banner three children was the right number two would have left too much empty space while four would have been too crowded then why didn't they pick two girls because we made several mock-ups of the banner and showed them to different children and the most popular design was that one well i don't i interrupt her at this point you may be pleased to see that the information pack that each child gets to take home has one boy and one girl I pick up the pack and show her. Well, that's nice. She then walks off and a teacher comes over to me. What was that all about? Apparently, I need to find a way to pick an equal number of boys and girls, despite the total number adding up to an odd total. Oh, for she stops herself. Because you didn't pick either of her two daughters as any of your seven volunteers out of 200 children in the school. Yeah, it would seem that way. What did you say to her? Well, I basically said that seven isn't divisible by two, but across multiple schools, we make sure to keep things equal. And what did she say? That's nice. While admittedly, I do think it would have been slightly more reasonable to have three girls and three boys for the first experiment and then just pick one for the second where you need one person, it's still very obvious that this woman doesn't really care about how many of each gender there are and just really wanted her kids to be involved. Mother tries to force child to ride after multiple incidents. Consent starts from three years old at my job. I teach horse riding to kids and adults starting at age three. That's when insurance will cover them and it's fun to see little kids experiencing ponies for the first time. My boss gives me a heads up that the client coming in is five years old and has ridden ponies 10 hands high for a while with an experienced horse person helping. But they have an issue as the kid is now terrified of ponies in general. So I meet the very polite kid and send her to play with the rocking horses in the waiting room while I find out from mum, the entitled mum of this story, what the deal is. She tells me the kid has been stepped on, bitten, fallen off multiple times, pony has bucked and bolted, and basically you name it and this kid has experienced it. I tell the mother I would give her six lessons to attempt to get the child comfortable around horses, but I did not guarantee I could get her on board. I had serious doubts. In this point in my 10 plus year career, I've never had a kid I couldn't get on board though. We start the session and the mother straight away looks disgusted. Keep in mind, she watched her daughter be injured by the experienced horse friend's lack of knowledge for a year and did nothing. I start the session with the rocking horses. There was no way I was taking this kid to the real thing before giving her some power back and building some trust. We talk about approaching a pony almost as if they're like scratches, where they don't really like you or to be touched. We talk about safe zones and all of that stuff. It took about 15 minutes of an hour session. The mother looked frustrated, but I ignored her. We move out to the real pony, who is 85 centimeters and a cute little fluff ball. She's also older than 30 years, so a quiet grandma who was half asleep. I did not realize that ponies could live that long. What? The kid freezes. So I sit her on a seat outside the yard and I go in. I move all around the pony and gently pat her all over like a soft slap noise to show that she isn't going to move or twitch. I then sit next to the pony's head and start putting scrunchies in her mane and asking the kid to pick them out for me. It took until the last 10 minutes for the kid to even pat the pony. We went on with slow progress like that for another two lessons and had gotten to the point that the pony was wearing a saddle and the child could stand on a mounting block beside her without freaking out. Cue the stupid mother. Just pick her up already. We've been here for three lessons and she still isn't on board. No, when she's ready, I'll ask her if she wants help to get on. 
but I will not force her. That's what's got you into this mess in the first place. I didn't have anything to do with her getting scared. Who lifted her on board every single time? Because I know she's never mounted a horse herself with her foot in the stirrup, pushing herself up and over. Nobody's ever asked her if she wanted to get on. You just picked her up bodily. But that's what everyone does. And kids don't know what they want anyway. You have to force them to try things. No, you don't. And I refuse to traumatize this child more than she already is. I will never pick her up and put her on, but I will help her do it herself if she wants to. Your child doesn't trust you, the pony, or me, or any adult for that matter, because of what's happened. We're trying to build that trust slowly and make her tolerate ponies again. It's not a quick fix, and what's happened to her would have broken many adult riders. She's five. Yeah, I guess remember that this kid, at five years old, has been kicked by a pony, been bucked and bolted, fallen off multiple times. That's very traumatizing. Now, this argument is happening in front of the kid, who was actually having a great session, and I thought I'd made a huge breakthrough. She then, though, started to shrink back, so I squatted down and told her, if you don't want to ride, no one's going to force you here. This is all about you, not mum. After another full session of me standing my ground and not letting the mother bully the situation, I had to tell her a few times to stay quiet and not comment, I am proud to say the child did get on board and we worked for an hour just getting on and off. My back was killing me after because during dismount, I bear hugged them from behind and swing their leg over and off. But we did it. In six months, that little girl was riding my Shetland, 10 hands high, on lead, in the arena, and loving it again. Unfortunately, COVID hit and lessons stopped for under eights until the following spring. I hope that little girl didn't go ride somewhere else and get scared again. But it's been years now, and I don't know. Well, look, OP, chances are you're never going to know, but that's absolutely fine because you did an unbelievable job here. Imagine trying to do your job with a child. First of all, dealing with kids is hard, especially when they don't want to necessarily do something. And then you've got that kid's mum in the background. Well, to be fair, not in the background, probably right on your shoulder, telling you what to do and how to do your job, pretty much berating you for taking too long to do things. That is extremely challenging. So to deal with not just the child's obvious fears of this thing, but also her bully of a mother telling you what to do and getting this result is extremely impressive. Fair play to you. There is absolutely no way that I would have been able to do that, even if I was an excellent horse riding instructor, which by the way, I think one day I could be. I've got the looks for it, you gotta say. Mad Margaret, the beginning. Today, I will be introducing you to a human being who is a curious mixture of entitled and insane. My first landlady, Mad Margaret. About eight years ago, I moved out of my parents' place practically a few months after returning from foreign exchange. My family is supportive, but pretty firmly believe in being autonomous and self-sufficient. So, I looked for a place to live near my, at the time, girlfriend, now fiancé. She lived on the outskirts of a larger city, and finding low rent would be difficult. Eventually, I found a room listed for about $500 a month, which is almost criminally low for the area. But I was a foolish child, and I didn't pick up on that first red flag. The second red flag came when I called to query about the room. My soon-to-be landlady made sure to emphasize that she was a pastor and a minister, that no amount of Satanism or evil thoughts would be allowed in the house. I am myself completely non-religious, so I foolishly believed that this would be perfectly fine. I explained that I was a student and would be doing student things. An agreement was made and I moved up shortly thereafter. Upon moving in, Mad Margaret was pleasant, if a little eccentric. She showed me to my room, my mum helped me unpack, and my mum and I left to get me some starting groceries. Upon our return, Mad Margaret showed me my shelf in the fridge and my shelf in the pantry. Mum and I load our stuff up and mum drives back home. Shortly afterwards, Mad Margaret apologized for leaving some of her groceries on the pantry and helped me move her stuff to a different shelf. This left all of my groceries stacked up in the middle of my shelf on the pantry because I didn't feel the need to spread them out. This is very important. My first morning in my new room, I wake up at around 8 a.m. to knock, 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 knock. Hey, Margaret, what's up? It's not going to work out. You need to pack your things up and leave. I'm sorry, what? You need to leave. It's not going to work out. Well, I paid first and last month's rent, so I'm here for at least two months. What's going on? Have I offended you? I don't need any of your feng shui, voodoo, devil rubbish in my house. 
Note, it was not her house. She was subleasing. I don't recall doing any feng shui voodoo devil rubbish. What do you mean? She beckons that I follow her and stomps off to the kitchen, where she flings open the pantry and points accusingly at my shelf. This feng shui rubbish. What's wrong with my groceries? How you organize them? You have them all stacked up in the middle like you're doing some feng shui rubbish to curse me and my child. Uh, no, I just left them there after we moved your groceries off my shelf yesterday. You had your stuff on the sides, so I put my stuff in the middle and then we moved your groceries. Hmm. Well, I've got my eye on you. And that, my friends, was day one in this house. I lived there for a little over half a year. If you guys are interested, I can provide more epic tales of this mad woman. She was entitled, nuts, and pretty racist against black people, Asians, and Hispanic people. And speaking of more tales of Mad Margaret, guys, don't worry, because here is Mad Margaret Part 2, her righteous defense against the shaman and warlocks, what a title. One of the mistakes I made very early on as an independent adult was to regularly offer my technical and electronic skills to anyone and everyone. It makes me feel cool and smart to fix things for people. I made this mistake with Margaret during my initial phone call setting up the rental situation. The next day, after she accused me of Satanism, based solely on how I organize my groceries, she called me over to the living room. I braced myself for another rant about my evil voodoo ways, but instead, Mad Margaret asked for my help. She asked about a way to get her camcorder to stream live to the internet. I figured this was an opportunity to get on her good side, so I take the camcorder in hand and start fiddling with it, as well as her computer to see what our options were. This was in 2013, so live streaming was nowhere near as commonplace as it is today. While playing with her outdated equipment to see if what she wanted was even possible, she began to explain why she wanted to live stream. You see, Mad Margaret has a hobby, Mad Margaret enjoys preaching daily to an empty room for about three consecutive hours, give or take an hour depending on her mood. I later learned that this was the safest time to enter and leave the house as she would not stop unless God himself showed up to tell her to shut up. Margaret began telling me how desperately important it was that she do this daily. The following conversation, while possibly not identically worded, as it has been nine years, has not been exaggerated in the slightest, nor is she being misrepresented. This is who this woman is. Thank you, Bailey, for helping me get this fixed up. I knew it was the right choice letting you live here. Did she forget that she accused me of Satanism just yesterday? No problem. I just really enjoy fixing things. Do you know why I do this? preaching to her living room behind a lectern every day because you're a minister i was desperately hoping this would be a short conversation well because i fight daily for the protection of the world and all the good godly people here Mm-hmm. you know there are people on the opposite side people who work with the devil to try and bring ruin to the world every day there are shaman out there begging their evils to prevent the sun from rising each day oh if i wasn't here preaching god's word they would win the sun wouldn't rise and we'd all die in a world of darkness. Yes, people, I am not exaggerating. This woman takes credit for the sun rising each day. Ah, well, thanks, I guess. Each day I speak out against these evils. You know, the other day I saw thousands of crows on your college campus. I knew they were sent by evil priests to stop my sermons. They're an evil that collects around the godless students at the college that you go to. I'm pretty certain that crows just have some kind of migration pattern up here in the fall. They do, of course. We get tons of crows every year. No, it's them students, I'll tell you. I had one of those Asians staying here last year. I tried to tell him about God and Jesus, but he tried to put an evil on me for it. That's unfortunate. He had this shrine with Buddhas and evil figures. He tried to use his magic to curse my son's flight, to crash the plane and kill him. Did his plane crash? No, because I stopped it with my sermons. Neato. I've had other students from your college come here. All of them evil. So many of them smoke the devil's lettuce and let Satan take over their body. Terrible influences on my other son. Later, I would find out her other son lived in a building next door and was hands down the biggest stoner I've ever met in my entire life. The dude was so chill and tried to redirect his mum from harassing us anytime he was there. I'm sorry, is all I can say. So how's the camera coming, honey? Um, can we get my videos online? You know, Margaret, I think that this camcorder and desktop are a little too old to be capable of doing that. I'm afraid you'll have to keep the recordings yourself. 
Following this, I left for my girlfriend's house as quickly as possible. Every day for the next month, Mad Margaret would attempt to pester or harass me into fixing her up to be live online. Each time I'd make an excuse to not get trapped into doing so. Now guys, although that is unfortunately the end of these mental Mad Margaret tales so far, there are more coming. Don't you worry. Look on the screen right now. These are the potential stories that OP can write about because you've got to remember all of this happened in 2013 and they lived with Mad Margaret for a while. So we've got Mad Margaret and the tales of other tenants, Mad Margaret and the tale of the possessed dog, Mad Margaret, the surprising, if brief, redemption arc. Mad Margaret and her crazy landlady. And then finally, Mad Margaret meets Bailey's dad. That is OP. So if you do want to see me cover them and give you updates to the Mad Margaret story in future episodes, just let me know in the comments down below. Wow, what an unbelievable woman is all I will say for now. The time Dr. Ick came for dinner. This is a funny story that happened a long time ago when I was in college. Back then, I had a friend who I loved. She was a sweet, mild girl who used to paint watercolor flowers. We met in art school. She was kind, gentle, and very meek. Her parents set her up with a gent who was about seven to nine years older, a friend of the family. Honestly, I couldn't take her boyfriend. He was rude, arrogant, and the total opposite of her. He had picked her up from classes many times. He was the snap, snap, I'm late for something guy. She would scramble to get her stuff ready so he wouldn't have to wait. In short, I thought he was a jerk. He was the guy who parked in the fire zone with his MD plates. So important he was because he was a doctor. He never really talked to the classmates, just kind of made her rush out of class to go and get their stuff done. Unless he was outside just honking to get her attention. Too important to come in and get her. I called him Doc Ick. My friends laughed. My sweet friend didn't. A few months into school, our married, grown-up friends decided to have a dinner party. We all got the invites. Of course, Dr. Boyfriend was coming. So, my sweet friend and Dr. Ick come late. We were all seated at the table by the time they arrived. He was introduced to the room. The doctor reprimanded the host for not calling him Dr. Insert first name. He wanted us to call him Dr. at the dinner table because he was a doctor. Did I mention he was a doctor? He was late because he had a doctor thing. Doctor, doctor, doctor. The host apologized, called him doctor first name, and then pointed him to the two seats at the end of the table, since we'd all been seated by now. But the doctor said that he would prefer to sit at the head of the table. After all, he was a doctor. He might be called out for an emergency during the dinner. The room got quiet, too quiet. The clock ticked gently in the background. And I began to laugh. Not just any laughter. Oh no, I broke into deep, hacking laughter of the condescending kind. You know, the big, ugly snort kind you see in movies, but pray your nose will never make in real life. Yeah, snorts, chuckles, and wheezes laughter. Ugly, funny laughter. It was just absolutely absurd, and he wasn't kidding either. He hadn't been with us for more than five minutes before he kicked the dude whose house we were in out of his own chair at the head of the table because he was a doctor. Well, after that, Dr. Ick turned purple from anger. What with me laughing at him at the dinner table and all. He was wild Defcon 1 level angry. I can say honestly, I didn't blame the guy. I guess I'd be annoyed too if someone broke out into joker-like laughter at my own existence, which yes, I was very guilty of. So there I am, laughing at the table when he starts lecturing me on how dumb I am, how he was a doctor, how dare I laugh at him. Which, you bet, made me laugh louder. I'm shocked I didn't swallow my own tongue at this point, honestly. I was in tears, gasping for air, snorting like some sort of hyena in the desert. I fell off my chair. I was asked if I smoked pot before I came. I didn't. I was just shaking my head no as I snickered. Unable to make words come out of my mouth. The laughter. I'd been hit with joker juice. Oh, thank God YouTube was not a thing yet because this was legendary meme stuff. I just thought this guy was such a jerk that this had to be some performance art thing, like some form of reverse stand-up. Who asked the host to get out of their chair whose meal you're about to eat after showing up late in the first place? Oh, I just found it hysterical. Well, at this point, we were all laughing. I'm not proud. Most of the folks in the room were outright laughing at me because it was just too funny not to. I mean, how can you not snicker at a grown woman dying of laughter on the floor at this jerk? It was hilarious, very infectious, and you bet, all my faults. I guess me rolling on the floor begging for air was something the good doctor wasn't interested in. 
because he took my sweet friend and his doc ick butt out of that house never to return again about 20 minutes later i composed myself i swear i was wiping away tears the chortling stopped and then everyone got real quiet like real real quiet too quiet even food on the table wine glasses filled the clock ticking in the background and i say in a very calm voice that guy was a dick can you please pass the mashed potatoes which started the laughter all over again best dinner party ever turns out my sweet friend had a dark side after all good for her when she saw me that following monday she gave it to me with both barrels and a stick i was insensitive i was a jerk i was a disgrace i was an absolute subpar human and a rotten friend all of which i could sort of agree with except for the subpar human bits i mean i might just be an extraordinary type human from not having my teeth explode out of my head from laughing so hard go me can that be a superpower well to summarize she wanted an apology not just to her but to dr ick he was coming to get her after class and i would have to make a big production about it too bells whistles groveling or she was done with me the good doctor parked his car in the fire lane strolled into our class folded his arms over his chest and waited for me to apologize i being the i that i am walked right up to the idiot and told him i'm sorry you're such a butthole and then i walked out of that class he was furious and i just kept walking while laughing well you bet she was done with me after that she made sure every class she took i was not in she eventually married that guy too everyone in our little r group at school except for us folks at the dinner party were invited to their big old doctor wedding i heard it was a lovely event out in the hamptons good for her also dr ick was a podiatrist and hey if mrs dr ick reads this i hope it all worked out well for you best wishes for a good life i still think about this night when it's going sideways in my life makes me laugh wow what a story and what a man a sensational human being there a a podiatrist is someone that deals with a doctor that deals with ankles feet and toes that sort of stuff now i don't know about you but I don't know about many accidents or emergencies that require someone that, that deals with feet, ankles, and toes to leave a dinner party and be at the head of the table and rush off in that split second. I could be wrong there. I don't know. I'm not a medical professional, and this is not medical advice. Just interesting nonetheless. You know, one word springs to mind with this doctor, and it is in fact the same word that describes my audio recording software. Audacity. Unbelievable it really is. Entitlement 101. Just, does this guy really even know how entitled and insane he's being? He probably doesn't, otherwise he wouldn't do it. Ultimately, thank you, Dr. Egg, because without you, I would never have had this enjoyment, and neither would you guys listening right now. So there we go. Let's get a thank you, Dr. Ick, in the comments down below for being such a good guy. Entitled ex-girlfriend wants the engagement ring I never gave her because she broke up with me before I could propose. Gets arrested for her troubles. A while back, I was dating this girl for roughly two years. I thought things were going great, but apparently she was just dating me because she liked to tell people she was in a relationship. Genuinely, that's how it went with her. The way she described me was too immature, decent in bed, and honestly not worth the rest of my life. Those are the exact words she said to a friend after we broke up. Anywho, I'm getting ahead of myself. I went out, bought a ring, and had this entire thing planned as to how to propose to her. However, she was suddenly not available for several weeks in a row. Well, my fears rang true as she suddenly showed up at my place one day. She acted like everything was normal as we talked, and she was grabbing everything that was hers. About halfway through, I just kind of looked to her and said, Don't forget your hair dryer. It would be awkward to have to come back after you dumped me. This sparked a long and awkward conversation where she was fake crying. I'd realized right then and there that I was an idiot. The way she acted, the way she spoke, and the way she treated me just screamed that she did not care. I was devastated, but seeing her made me angry. I'd realized she was lying to me this entire time. About a month later, a friend of hers called me up and asked if she could come over to talk. I asked her why, and she said that my ex had annoyed her and she wanted to tell me some things. My mind goes to horrifying things, like she needs to warn me I need to see a doctor or something like that. Well, her friend came over and we chatted for a while. See, her friend was beyond angry. The way my ex acted at the end of our relationship really angered her. So her way to get back at her friend was to sleep with her ex-boyfriend. Me being in my mental state, I said yes. 
More like I said, huh? Sure, yeah, we can do that if you really want to. So she ends up staying over for a few days as we get to talking about my ex. I tell her about the ring and she had the best idea to get back at her. Let's lay down in bed and post a pic of ourselves with the ring in between us. Yeah, I thought it was a terrible idea, but I wanted my ex to feel like trash. So, well, there you go. Not even two hours later, my ex was at my door. We posted the picture at about 11 a.m. and she was at my place at 12.40 something. Right off the bat, she tried to act like breaking up with me was a mistake. She said that I was the best boyfriend she'd ever had and she was getting scared with how serious things were getting. She said she made a terrible mistake in breaking up with me. Well, her friend immediately goes into a rant about my ex, saying that she was manipulative and that neither of us would believe this sob story that she was giving. I've got to say, I'm very glad her friend was there because my stupid butt was actually believing her. I reminded her of how she treated me when she broke up with me and that she should go back home. She was wasting her time. Well, now she brought up the ring and said she was owed it under the law, saying that rings are gifts and that I cannot take it back. In unison, me and her friend said that I never gave it to her. We both looked at each other and laughed at the absurdity of the situation. It was getting outrageous. She said she was owed that ring and that she was not leaving without it. At about this time, a police officer came up the stairs, wanted to know what the trouble was. I guess we made enough noise that neighbors called the police. The female officer asked what the situation was. Everyone tried to talk at once and the officer shut us down. She pointed at my ex and asked her what the problem was. She said she was trying to pick up her stuff after we broke up. The officer asked me if that was true. I explained the situation as to how my ex broke up with me before I had the chance to propose and that she was never given the ring. Throughout the conversation, two more officers showed up, one a supervisor. The whole story was explained about four times. At one point, my ex said that the money from the ring will let her pay off her car. Ever seen a moment when someone says something so outrageous that everyone looks at them in utter disgust? I responded saying that the ring isn't even expensive. It was bought used off a website. And I reminded her that I'm an IT tech. So this wasn't a ring that was 10 to 12K, more like 1 to 1.5K. The anger and rage that came over her face was immediately apparent to everyone. She stepped forward and punched me in the chest and kicked at me before being tackled to the ground by the female officer. The supervisor on scene told us to go inside while they get her under control. We did, and about 10 minutes later, they came back. They wanted my statements. I told them I didn't want to press charges against her, but they said, yeah, it doesn't work like that. We saw it, so it's being processed. She ended up getting a misdemeanor offense for it. I mean, I don't know about you lot, but for me, that is some of the worst logic I've ever heard. Something you haven't even received yet, but you're saying it's yours. How? First of all, you never got engaged. Second of all, you never gave her the ring. And third of all, I might be wrong here, but I think that engagement rings have to be given back if they break up with you because they don't fall under the gift rule. They're a token of your promise. And if you break that promise, then it's not yours anymore. I might be wrong there, let me know. Karen gets arrested because I wasn't being a good cashier? So, I used to work as a cashier in a supermarket. This story took place on my fourth day of work there and my second day working at a cash on my own without a supervisor sitting next to me, teaching me the ropes. Yes, I had two days of training. I'm sure most of you will figure out which country I live in from the following explanation. It will become relevant later. Supermarkets in my country are a zoo on a regular day. However, Thursdays and Fridays are absolute mayhem at the store and are a special kind of hell. Fridays, the store closes two hours before sundown, as do most stores in this country. During winter, this means around 2 p.m. and in summer, closer to 4.30. People get crazy on Fridays, trying to get all their shopping done and get home in time to cook dinner. If you can avoid coming to the store on Friday, please do so at all costs. I always told people after this day. The reason Thursdays are hell is because we get all the customers who don't want to come on Friday. Now, this was early evening on a Thursday at a time when the store is absolutely jam-packed. We had 10 checkout lines open and every line had at least six to seven people in line. Basically, if you're stuck with a slow cashier, there is nowhere else to go unless you have 10 items or fewer. Everything is going well until I get a customer with two shopping carts full of items, mostly non-perishable items. And these are the large carts you find around big stores in the US, like Walmarts. I found out later he buys this for a community center in his neighborhood, and he fills up their pantry twice a year. Nice guy. He greeted me very politely and then said the most dreaded words I could have heard that night. 
This will be a delivery. Just a quick break from the store to explain why this was so dreaded, especially on a day like today. When we get a delivery, the cashier would call a helper from the store to help bag the groceries. Usually people do their own bagging. The bags would then be placed in plastic containers and containers would then be placed on top of each other and taken to the back fridge until delivery. A regular delivery is usually between three to five crates. Each crate has a number and I put all those into a computer along with the correct delivery address and phone number and print it out with the receipts and place copies on the crates. Even for a small delivery, this always takes extra time. Back to the story. So this guy has two full carts and wants a delivery. I say, sure, no problem. Then I turn to everyone else in line and let them know that this is a delivery and it will take just a bit longer than usual and apologize for any delay this may cause. We always do this so customers will be aware of the delay and can move to another cash if they're in a hurry. This is when the whole line groans simultaneously. I don't blame them. There was nowhere else to go. I could see every one of them craning their necks to check out other lines and they all decided to stay. So I start scanning as fast as I can. I'm pretty good with numbers. So even though it's my fourth day, I remember many of the codes and things are moving rather quickly. I get to a point where the bagger can't keep up with all the items and the area to the left of me where I place all the scanned items is just a mountain of cans and bags of chips and whatnot. I can't even scan another item because they're falling back onto my scale. At this point, I stop and ask if he wants help bagging. The customer and the bagger are both appreciative and I help bag groceries for a few minutes, just enough to clear some space so I can continue scanning items. This happens every few minutes. It gets full, I stop to help, clear some space and then keep going. This is where the Karen comes into play. She's maybe early 40s, long brown hair and looks nothing like a Karen except for the way she was standing with one hand on her hip that extended so far to the side, I wasn't sure how she was still standing. She's in my line, about five to six people in front of her still. This is the conversation that follows. Hello, what are you doing? I don't answer at this point because I didn't think she was talking to me. I keep scanning. Excuse me, what kind of a cashier are you? Why aren't you doing your job? Stop being lazy and do your job. She screams at the top of her lungs. I'm sorry, mom. I'm just trying. That's not your job. You're a cashier. Do your job. Just do your job. I realize now after reading so many Reddit stories that this would have been a perfect chance for some malicious compliance. I'm sure some of you hope that I did just what Karen wanted. Too bad I didn't know about it then. Or that it was only my fourth day on the job. That's not what happened. Although I dream sometimes that I did just that. You know, sit back and sip my coffee until the space cleared for more scanned items. You know, be a cashier next time. I'm just helping to move things along faster, I reply. If this is a problem or you're in a hurry, feel free to move to another line. I'm sure another cashier will be more than happy to serve you. I may sound like the butthole with this line, but I said it really nicely, not sarcastically at all. Obviously, that didn't help though. The Karen wasn't really listening anyway and was having none of it. Just do your dang job. You are a cashier. What is wrong with you? Are you stupid? You should be fired. I stopped listening at this point and I don't answer as I'm still helping to bag and scan as fast as possible, knowing it's not going to help anyway. However, I see one of my managers, let's call him Joe, walk up to Karen. Joe is great, by the way, always helping the workers. What seems to be the problem? Asked Joe. Karen is still yelling. Your cashier is awful. She's lazy and not doing her job. You should fire her. Tell her to do her job. She's not doing her job. She repeated that a few times like a broken record. Joe looks over at me for a second and understands exactly what's happening. He turns to Karen and says, can't you see she's trying to help? She's trying to make this go much faster. Now Karen starts screaming words, I'm assuming, but I couldn't really make them out. She was practically foaming at the mouth. Joe tries to calm her down by explaining, or trying to, how me bagging items is actually helping. But this makes Karen even more irate, if you can believe it. Spit flying from her mouth, arms flailing, screaming like a banshee. Suddenly, I notice an older woman. She must have been around 80 years old, trying to get Karen's attention by tapping her on the shoulder. It takes a few tries, but she finally gets her attention and spins her around by her shoulder. Hey, Karen, Karen, excuse me, Karen? What? Your daughter is crying. This is when the entire store seemed to have stopped talking all at once, like someone pressed mute and turned off the volume. The seat of people in front of me parts a bit 
and we all look down and see a little girl who couldn't have been older than four clutching her mother's thighs bawling her eyes out it's not coming out of everywhere hyperventilating this girl was terrified and i can't blame her seeing her mother going off like that must have been terrifying and she's got no idea what's happening she's in a huge store where she knows no one and she's practically invisible this silence lasted an entire two seconds because that's when karen started yelling at joe look what you did you and your stupid lazy cashier made my daughter cry and a bunch of other crazy sounds that were perhaps supposed to be words things happened in slow motion for the next few seconds she starts swinging at joe Joe's not a big guy, but he's bigger than Karen, that's for sure, and not easily intimidated. This is not his first Karen. She would have decked him right in the face if the nice old lady hadn't grabbed her in a bear hug to stop her. Yes, she actually did that. I had to pick up my jaw off the floor. At that point, other customers get involved, trying to peel off the old lady from Karen and stop the Karen from trying to kill Joe and from joe trying to kill karen because he was fuming by this point then i saw more security storm the castle our store was inside a mall and the sea of people just surrounded karen and i couldn't really see much of anything anymore kind of like football players when there's a fumble and they all jump on the ball by the sound of yelling getting further and farther away i figured karen was being led either to the back office or to the mall security office more jail this entire time this is happening i'm still bagging and scanning items and i'm about halfway through this customer's purchase i finish up with him with no more problems he was very nice with me and thanked me profusely for helping with the bags even though technically it wasn't part of my job he said i was the fastest and nicest cashier he'd ever had the pleasure of meeting i was just happy to help no one else in my line complained i actually got compliments from people about keeping my composure Apparently, many cashiers in my country think it's okay to yell at customers and just be plain nasty. I worked in customer service for many years prior, and I've never yelled at a customer, even if they deserved it. Once the rush died down a bit, I went for a break. I met another employee in the back room, and I started to tell him what just happened when he cut me off. She was yelling at you? Oh my god. I heard that. Well, everyone heard that, but I had no idea what the frick was happening. He then told me the police were called and Karen was escorted out of the store and the mall in handcuffs. I filled him in on everything and we spent the next 30 minutes just laughing. I don't know what happened with the child. I'm assuming they called another family member to pick her up. I also don't know what happened with the Karen after that, since I ended up working there for another year and I never saw her again. Hopefully, she learned to do her grocery shopping on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Or maybe she was in prison or house arrest. This was the first Karen I had the displeasure of meeting while working at that store. But it definitely wasn't the last. It's always the worst, isn't it? When it's blatantly obvious that a kid is screaming because of their entitled parent. But that parent just doesn't get it. Keeps on screaming and the kid keeps crying. And then they're shocked and blaming on other people. It's great stuff, it really is. I wish we knew what happened to Karen in the end. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter. I just feel bad for that kid. Like, imagine crying because your own parent is the one that shouts. Everyone else is being reasonable in the store, getting their shopping done, and you're crying because your own parent is the one screaming and being, of course, entitled. What a mother. My mum called me fat and expects me to apologise. My mum, who is 50 years old, and I, 25, have always had a strange relationship due to her, you know, being a crazy she-bat. She's an aggressive narcissist, gaslighter, who has always favoured my younger, drug-addicted, money-thieving brother for Lord knows what reason. Mum and I did actually have a period of my childhood where she said she would brag to her friends about me, that I get good grades and don't run off with boys getting pregnant and don't do drugs, etc. I realised a couple of years ago that I don't really remember when she stopped saying those nice things about me. Did she ever? Maybe she was lying then, too. Well, little did I know that not only had she stopped saying nice things about me, if she ever did, but she's been slagging me off to our family, my uncle, aunts, and many cousins and nana, for years. I didn't find out about this until two weeks ago. I got a phone call from my cousin who said she doesn't want to keep quiet about something anymore and had to tell me that my mum was over at my aunt's in front of the entire family mocking me. She said I'm too sensitive. A lifetime of being put down by your mum will do that, but hey, that I'm self-conscious of my body and that it's probably because I'm fat and that she has to choose her words carefully around me 
because otherwise I might start a fight. Now, just days before this, I'd gone to a bridesmaid dress fitting for her own wedding at my mum's place, and the dress was massive on me. I'm very curvy, but the dress was even bigger. My mum, in half an hour, managed to insult my body, my skin, my body hair, and more. I have chronic depression, and she knows this, and I spent the next week in a manic depressive spiral. She didn't care. So to get that phone call from my cousin was the last straw. I posted a poem on my socials, which I had no intention of posting before, about how my mum tore me down during one dress fitting. She contacted me soon after and was saying everything was my fault anyway, and how could I post that poem? It's been two weeks now of no contact. I've been to two family events with her there, and I've actually been much calmer and happier without her hanging around me, and I think she knows it. Yesterday at a carnival with the family, mum was there again. I didn't say a word and I enjoyed myself with my other family thoroughly. My cousin told me she'd overheard my mum saying she's waiting for me to come to her, but I have no intention of doing that anymore. Later, my uncle sat down with me and said my mum feels this is so weird and he doesn't want me to have any regrets, etc. And he can't imagine me not being at my mum's wedding. He says this after witnessing my mum making fun of me and calling me fat pretty much asking me to forgive and forget and move on. I don't know about you, but I've experienced more happiness and growth in the two weeks that I've cut my mum off than I think I would by forgiving and forgetting the trash that she's done to me for the hundredth time. I don't think I'll forgive and move on like I always had before. I think I'll just move on without her with a smile on my face. Unbelievable. Your mother, who called you fat behind your back, is waiting for you to apologize to her. If that is not entitled, I don't know what is. And also, what is your uncle doing here? Clearly, you don't want to be associated with this woman anymore. That's blatantly obvious. And he's saying, no, you're going to regret it. What, she's going to regret being called horrible things behind her back? I doubt it. Entitled mum tries to force me to leave the park because she is convinced my little sister is actually my daughter. There's a ten and a half year age gap between me and my little sister. When I was a teen, I often used to take her to the local park to give my mum a break or give her time to get some housework done, etc. At the time this story happened, I was 15. It was Wimbledon season, the tennis grand slam. So my mum asked me to take my sister to the park for a few hours so she could watch it in peace. She gave me some money so we could get some fish and chips in town and some ice cream at the park. There was usually an ice cream van there. So we got some fish and chips, went to the beach for a bit to buy mum extra time, and then we headed to the park. As we approached the park gate, this entitled mum, who was dragging along her child, glared at me. You should be ashamed. I looked around, but there was nobody else she could have been talking to. Dumbfounded, I blankly pointed at myself as if to affirm that she was talking to me. Girls these days are such sluts, opening their legs to anyone who asks, who got you knocked up? Or let me guess, you don't know. I stared blankly at her for a minute. Uh, this is my little sister. The woman rolled her eyes and leered at me. Yeah, we had little sisters in my day too. I just said, okay, bye, and walked away because I was uncomfortable with conflict and just wanted out of that situation. Don't you dare go into the park, she said. You'll spread your filthy diseases all over. I don't want my son catching your diseases. I ignored her and rushed into the park. Surely she'd leave me alone when I was surrounded by other kids and parents, right? Wrong. The entitled mum followed me around the park demanding that I leave. The more I ignored her, the madder she got. And she kept repeating over and over, get out, get out, you're not allowed here. At this point, a few parents noticed. One mum, let's call her FM, friendly mum, who my mum and I often chatted with, immediately stood and rushed over just as the entitled mum grabbed my arm and yanked at me. Why are you grabbing a child? Let her go. Who are you? Mind your freaking business. Let her go or I'm calling the police. The entitled mum let me go, but then turned her anger towards this woman, shouting that she was just making the park safe for her child and I shouldn't be here because I might spread some nasty disease all over the place. She never specified what disease. I'm guessing she meant an STI or something. More parents started coming over to see what was going on. Seeing she was outnumbered, the entitled mum eventually left, dragging her child behind her, screaming obscenities at us as she slinked away. The friendly mum then gave us a lift home to make sure we were safe. When I told my mum what happened, she was furious. She packed us into the car and drove us around town to look for the woman, but we didn't spot her. 
Thankfully, I never saw that woman again. What I don't understand is even if this woman was right and say you were a teen mum with your daughter, why would that matter? Why would that be any of her business? Like it's clear that you're not, but who cares if you even are? I don't get it. Like why is she getting involved? It's so weird. I also love that she literally said to the other woman, mind your freaking business. Yeah, maybe take a leaf out of your own book. Uh, Cause that is funny. Yikes, Mildred. Guess your son will never walk again. Today, I bring you another emergency room tale. In today's story, a man in his 50s, let's call him Wilbur, is brought in, clearly in pain. He's accompanied by his mother, Mildred, mid-70s. Upon questioning, he tells us he fell on his butt, essentially, and has intense pain that resembles electricity going down his right leg. That's a clear indication of a herniated intervertebral disc. We do an MRI and sure enough, a disc is compressing his spinal cord. He also has a vertebral fracture, which while not compromising anything currently, seems so busted, it appears to be keeping itself together through the magical powers of sweat, sticky tape, bubble gum, and well-intentioned vibes. So it must be treated ASAP before it compromises the spinal cord too. By this point, the neurosurgeon is already talking to the lad and his Mildred and making a convincing case for what he considers the best option, surgery. Mildred isn't pleased by such an outrageous and radical solution, which she claims we're suggesting in order to get richer quick because surgery isn't the answer to everything, you see. She then looks at Wilbur with furious eyes, more piercing than a fencing foil, and asks him, What do you think, sweetie? Are you gonna let these abusive monsters rip you off like this? Wilbur, sad and reluctantly, said, defeated, Well, I, well, no, but... Mildred interrupts him, and with a triumphant and devilish sneer, exclaims, See? We want a second opinion. We are leaving. We tried to reason with them, but all attempts were futile. They then signed a document that certifies they leave on their own free will, no medical discharge, and left. I felt really sorry for the lad. He seemed to genuinely want to consider the options we could provide. But for whatever reason, his mother seemed to reign over all aspects of decision making. Wilbur returned about five days later in an ambulance, now with a much more frantic Mildred, who was issuing instructions left and right, all accompanied by an accusatory finger and flailing limbs. Something had put her on a Karen Crimson frenzy, and she was out for blood. We began our usual questions, and what we found out was terrifying. Apparently, Mildred took Wilbur to a chiropractor, who went on to do a cracking job on his spine to fix it. And after an audible crunch, Wilbur could no longer move and feel his legs, which prompted a race back to the emergency room. Unfortunately, the damage to Wilbur's spinal cord meant there was nothing to be done to recover his legs. Wilbur was sadly sentenced to a wheelchair for the rest of his life and he will never again feel his feet touching grass, sand, or the waves of the sea. I cannot believe what I've just read. I'm genuinely quite lost for words after that one. A mother's entitlement has cost her child, her son, the ability to walk. Like, are you... Are you I, 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 that is unbelievable how stupid do you have to be to go to the hospital them to say yeah we think this is the best line of action for your son like to just ignore the advice and then go to a chiropractor because that's definitely going to work out like how risky is that obviously the chiropractor should know not to do this but nonetheless i still put the full blame on the mum for not just taking the advice in the first place like come on it's insane and finally i kind of hate to say this because it might seem harsh but i do blame wilbur a bit for this you're a 50 year old man mate like at what point do you say you know you know what mum i'm gonna do with this myself i'm 50 like look i get it you want to respect your mum's opinion and take her advice but at some point you've got to just you know stand on your own two feet at the age of four <laughs> yeah i didn't even mean to make that yeah horrible situation all around let's move on to the full story i genuinely didn't even mean to say that wilbur i'm sorry entitled in-laws want to say in our baby's last name and our partner registration dates my girlfriend and i both women are expecting a baby in order to get the paperwork in order and make it official, we decided to book an appointment at the city hall and register our partnership. Basically the same as marriage in our country. This is free on Wednesday mornings and we're allowed six guests. My girlfriend calls her parents to invite them to the ceremony. Right away, without missing a beat, they start spouting obstacles. They say the date is inconvenient, that they have other things to do. And where is it? Oh my God, I don't know how to get there. Then her father asks about the last name we're choosing. We plan to both take on both our last names, which we'd already explained to them. 
He then asked about the baby's last name. Now we want the baby to share a last name with us. But in our country, there is no legislation for this yet. But they've been working on it and it should be an option soon. This means we have to choose a temporary last name until we can change it. And since my girlfriend is carrying the baby and has her DNA, we decided on my last name. Her father said he found this strange because it was her baby. My girlfriend said that she did not accept this, that the baby is mine as well. And if he didn't accept this, she was done talking. She then hung up. She wrote to her mother that the date was off, which she interpreted as, oh, you changed the date for us. That was a great idea. My girlfriend explained that no, the date still stood, but she was hurt by her father's comments. And if that's their stance, we celebrate without them. Enter full blown victim mode from mother. We should have discussed our date with them and your father is a man. Of course he wants his last name passed on. Be more understanding and I see how it is. Apparently, our partnership date and baby last name are a democratic decision. This incident, by the way, follows a gem of a comment from her mother. We're still getting to know you. Why? I've been dating your daughter for five and a half years now. Shouldn't you know me at this point? They made it obviously clear that they're not happy with their daughter's partner choice. After all this, I decided to keep my own name rather than taking on the name of such a narrow-minded family. And my girlfriend is seriously considering taking on my name just to spite her parents. Yeah, you know what? Your girlfriend's right. Sack them off, sack their surname off, and get your friends along who you actually want to be at your ceremony because you don't want them there, ruining the day, just chatting a little rubbish. And um, yeah, it's better off they're not involved with your daughter at all. Can you actually imagine if your girlfriend just sacks off her name entirely? Like just says, I don't want to be associated with my parents anymore and just takes on your name unbelievable if that happens and i kind of hope it does entitled mother tries to drop her child off after he'd been sick the previous day twice i work in childcare with kids aged three to five i love working with the children but sometimes the parents as you can imagine are not the most fun to work with especially this particular one around lunch a week ago a kid was eating his lunch when suddenly he threw up we rushed him to the toilet and comforted him We called up the entitled mum of this story and told her she had to come and pick him up. She said she would and hung up. A few hours passed and we had to call her again. She promised she was on her way. Only a little earlier than her usual pickup time, she showed up. Our policy states that the child can't come back for 48 hours after the last time they were sick. They left and the day went on as normal. The next day, we were outside letting the kids get some fresh air when the door went. We were all confused as all of the kids that were supposed to be there already were. My colleague answered and it was the entitled mum with her kid. Before my colleague could say anything, the mum practically pushed her son through the door and ran. We both panicked, not knowing what to do. We went to our boss who said it was all right since neither me or my colleague had dealt with a situation like that before. She assumed the entitled mum wouldn't pick up her phone and we didn't want to traumatize the poor kid. So we just let him stay. A few days ago, almost a week after the original incident, near the end of the day, the exact same kid wasn't looking too well. We took his temperature and it was on the cusp of a spike. Then he ran to the bathroom and vomited. We called his entitled mum. She didn't pick up the first time. The second time she picked up, annoyed. We explained the situation. She told us she was already on her way and hung up. This time she was true to her word, but that might just be because it was near his regular pickup time. We stressed that he would not be allowed back for 48 hours. She walked away without a word. The next day I was answering the door. When I was about to bring in another kid, the entitled mum turned up again with her poor kid. I could sense the same thing was about to happen again as she was very hurriedly saying goodbye. So in a panic, I said I'd be right back and I shut the door. I ran inside and got my colleague. I told her the same woman had turned up and I didn't know what to say. She went out to talk to her while I looked after the kids that had already been dropped off. She came back in without the kid and explained what happened. This entitled mum is originally from another country. So when my colleague explained the situation, the entitled mum pretended that she couldn't understand her. But we were in luck as the parent of the other kid I was bringing in spoke the same language as the entitled mum and explained it to her in their language. Therefore, she had no choice but to accept the situation and leave with her kid. I'm currently off on holiday, so I'm not sure if she tried again the day after 
but I honestly wouldn't put it past her. Now, from the mum's point of view, I get it. It's probably extremely annoying when your kid gets sick and that means that you have to take time off work and deal with them. But that is also part of being a mother and a parent in general, right? Like, that's kind of part of the deal. Entitled dad gets his son bitten by a venomous snake. This past weekend, I decided that it would be a good idea to hit up some biking trails at the local nature preserve. I packed up my trail bike early in the morning to go riding, since the morning was the coolest the temperatures were going to be for that day. A thing to note is that in Texas, we experience triple digit heat in the summer. And because of this, snake encounters are much more frequent in parks and nature preserves. Most of the time, the snakes tend to avoid places where people frequent, even more so with bikers. However, sometimes there are rare encounters. So then, onto the story. I was riding through the trails just enjoying the scenic ride. I was enjoying cool temperatures due to the forest overcast and the wonderful serenity of nature. I'd soon reached a part of the trail that ran alongside a creek and up ahead, I saw a park ranger holding a long stick standing next to a plastic container. I also noticed that he was intensely focused on something on the side of the trail. As I approached, the park ranger saw me and quickly put his hand out, motioning to me to stop. I immediately hit the brakes and got off my bike. Out of curiosity, I tilted my head to catch a glimpse of what the ranger was focused on. What I saw caused my eyes to grow wide. On the side of the trail was a very beautiful but very venomous copperhead that was coiled up to strike. I quickly checked my surrounding area to see if there were any other snakes near me. Luckily for me, I didn't see any. I nervously watched as the ranger caught the copperhead using his stick carefully placed it inside his container and slammed it shut. I breathed a heavy sigh of relief. Nice catch. The park ranger held up the box. Thank you. We usually don't get copperheads on this part of the preserve. This little guy must have wandered here overnight. Enter the entitled parents. As I got closer to the park ranger to get a better look at the snake, I heard a voice coming from behind me. A kid, about 12 years old and with a British accent, was approaching with his dad, a tall and very husky fellow, and they saw the ranger holding up the box with the still very angry copperhead inside. Daddy, look, that man has a snake. It reminds me of the one I had back in England. Pretty one, isn't it? Maybe we can take it home as your new pet snake, said his dad. The entitled dad walked right up to the park ranger. Excuse me, sir. Do you think by chance you could give me that snake so I can let my son keep it as a pet? The park Park Ranger gave the man a look that clearly had the expression of, Are you serious right now? I really don't think you want this snake as a pet. Oh, rubbish. I've had pet bull pythons for years back in my home country. This snake won't be any different. This is definitely not a bull python, nor a snake you should treat as one. Okay, just give me the snake. The entitled dad then suddenly snatched the box away from the park ranger and pushed him back, causing him to stumble backwards and fall into the creek. I rushed to help up the park ranger, and as I was doing so, I saw the Darwin Award-worthy moment unfold. The kid looks at the snake and says, Daddy, he's beautiful. Can I pet him before we take him home? Sure. The dad opened the box containing the still angry copperhead, and the kid proceeded to reach inside. The snake obviously wasted no time and immediately lashed out and bit the entitled kid's hand. The kid cried out in pain and started crying. The entitled dad threw the box on the ground to which the snake quickly escaped into the bushes. I was very attentive as to where the snake landed and slithered off to. While the entitled dad was checking on his kid, the park ranger called for a medical unit and notably a police officer. The entitled dad seemed confused about the call. I don't think the medical call is necessary. It's just a minor snake bite. I don't think you understand, sir. That snake wasn't just a harmless ball python. That snake was a copperhead. Bites from them are venomous. Wait, so you're telling me that you guys just let venomous snakes freely roam the park? Well, sir, this area is part of the snake's natural habitats. Still, you guys should be doing something about that. People walk through here. Yeah, that's exactly what I was doing until you took the snake from me, sir. The dad then looks at me. Can you believe this rubbish? Don't bring me into this, dude. After all, you did take the snake from the ranger. Ugh, the dad scoffs. A golf cart with a medic and what looked like a senior ranger arrived, and the medic immediately sat the entitled kid down to look at the bites. The senior ranger walked over to us, and the entitled dad wasted no time complaining. You blokes ought to be ashamed of yourselves. A public park with dangerous snakes wandering about? Sir, 
This region is part of their natural habitats. While we do work to keep them from public areas, you are still going to encounter them from time to time. But from what my coworker tells me, you took the snake from him and then let your son try to pet it. The dad was visibly nervous. Um, yes? Well, we have an ambulance to take your son to the hospital at the park entrance and an officer that would like to have a word with you. I suggest you come with me. The entitled dad sheepishly got onto the car with his son and the four of them all left for the park entrance. I took the opportunity and finished up my bike ride while keeping an eye out for any more snakes. When I got to the park entrance, I saw the senior ranger from earlier. I curiously asked him what happened after they got back to the park entrance. Apparently, the cop they called was waiting for the entitled dad when they got there. The cop let him off with a warning, but not after giving him a stern butt chewing about how he should have arrested him for child endangerment. Wow, does it get more stupid than this dad? I mean, long-term viewers and listeners of my channel will know that I myself do have a pet snake called Marty. He is a corn snake. It literally doesn't get less venomous or less dangerous to a human than a corn snake. Yet, even though Marty is just a corn snake and he's barely bitten anyone in his entire life, I am still careful around him because I know that he has the potential to bite people because he's a snake. It's obvious. So the fact that this entitled dad, even after being told that this snake is venomous, still encourages his 12-year-old kid to touch it and wants to take it home as a pet just shows how ridiculous he is. And it's a shame, to be honest, that the kid was the one that got bitten and not the dad. My entitled family don't like my boyfriend for all the wrong reasons. So these events happened in July 2021, but I'm just finding out about them now. I am a 21-year-old woman, and exactly one year ago, my 22-year-old boyfriend of two years got caught on fire. His leg was badly burned, and he has permanent scars from his left foot all the way up to his right ear. He spent a few days in hospital and was discharged, but he couldn't work or drive for a month and had difficulty walking by himself. 15 days after his burn was my cousin's graduation party. We were both invited and my boyfriend was very insistent that we show up because we said we would. I talked to my cousin and his parents and explained the situation and that we can't stay for long due to my boyfriend's condition. They understood and were happy that we decided to show up despite everything So the day of the grad party arrives and I go for a more dressy look because I know my cousin and his family are kind of snobby My boyfriend wants to dress up too seeing as this is his first time that he'd meet my extended family But the clothes are too tight on his body and they cause him excessive pain So I encourage him to wear something more casual saying my family will understand I drive and we show up straight up. My boyfriend doesn't look the best He's in baggy casual clothing that shows his bandages. His normally long blonde hair is singed and matted because he hadn't washed it in a week. Water and burns don't mix. My boyfriend limps around with me at his side, meeting everyone and making small talk. We eat food, we congratulate my cousin, and after an hour or so, we go. After such a short encounter, I didn't expect my family to immediately like him. I asked around and everyone said they don't know him well enough to form an opinion about him, which is fair. However, I recently learned through my mum that this was not the case. Most of my extended family hates my boyfriend and for the most stupid of reasons. They don't like that he has long hair or that he works a blue collar job and even that he didn't show up in fancy clothes. They're disappointed that I choose to date trash like him. That's their words, not mine. Some of my aunts even started planning a trip to take me to Italy so I can meet foreign boys in hopes of me cheating on my boyfriend. I would have understood if they didn't like him because he seemed like a butthole or for any good reason. But knowing what I know now makes me rethink everything I know about them and I see how entitled they've been. Yeah, pretty simple one here. Your family are all just snobs. I mean, you said it yourself, so it's not a rude thing for me to say. And it's definitely true. I mean, come on, any normal person after meeting someone who has gone through something as horrible as this would give them so much lenience. It's amazing that he even came in the first place. That shows unreal commitment and would not be expected of him in a normal family, let's be honest. I mean, come on, what do they want? Him to stay there hobbling around for six plus hours wearing horrifically uncomfortable clothes just to look good? No one cares, ultimately. I rate you for showing up. I probably wouldn't have bothered. My mum thinks she's entitled to my prostitute money. So, for the last couple of years, I've worked as a dancer at a well-known gentleman's club. It's quite high-end and security is very good. A customer only has to say something we don't like and they'd get kicked out. It's actually a lot of fun and when it's a good night, the tips are great and I managed to save a decent amount of money. I didn't tell my mum where I was working as I knew exactly what her reaction would be. 
Unfortunately for me, about a year in, someone she knew had come to the club and spotted me there. Of course, it didn't take long to get back to her. She hit the roof and called me everything you could think of, including a prostitute, and then she kicked me out. I stayed with a friend for about a week until I managed to secure an apartment and decided to get on with my life. I'm making enough to support myself quite comfortably. I guess my mum found all of this out from my sister and she realized I was making decent money because out of nowhere, she calls me to demand money. No hello or how are you? But I apparently owe her more for letting me live at home. I did pay rent while I was living at home, although I probably could have paid more considering I was earning quite a bit, but I didn't want to raise suspicions and I gave my mum what was asked of me. Now, before I even comment on the story, guys, there is an update. I've not had a lot of contact with my mum since my first post, apart from yesterday, which I will get to, and also when she dumped a box at my front door that had our two house cats in. Luckily, I was in, as she hadn't bothered with air holes. I caught her just as she was about to leave, and she told me she couldn't afford to take care of them and didn't like the hair. Fair enough, I missed them a lot, and they actually, after settling in, got on really well with my puppy that I'd recently bought. So for the last month or so, I've had a friend from the club staying with me. She just came out of a really bad relationship and needed somewhere to stay for a while. I've loved having her here. She's great company, pays her way, and takes turns cooking and cleaning, so I'm not in a rush for her to move out. Anyway, a couple of days ago, I get a call from my sister in tears. She's just broken up with her boyfriend, and he's kicked her out. I'm not surprised, to be honest. My sister, like my mum, does not work and would spend all day lazing around while he worked. She also didn't clean or cook or do anything as far as I could see, and they were constantly arguing. After speaking to her for a while, trying to console her, I said goodbye and didn't think much of it. Until yesterday. Mum calls and asks why the heck I haven't taken my sister in, and what kind of sister would let her go homeless? I calmly reminded her that she had an empty house, so why couldn't my sister stay there? She then starts screaming that she has no job and neither does my sister, so how the heck is she supposed to afford her staying there? I told her that I have a friend staying with me and that I just do not have the room for my sister to stay as well. Well, that completely set her off. I couldn't make out much of what she was saying, but I did hear selfish lesbian female dog and at that point I just cut the phone off. I've blocked her number for now. I do feel slightly guilty about my sister, but with two of us, two cats, and a dog, it's cozy enough as it is. Thanks for reading. I just had to get this off my chest, as I think it's insane. Well, you're not wrong there, OP. It certainly is insane. Um, What I don't get is, from your mum's perspective, why can't her daughter just go and move back in with her? That's what would normally happen, right? It's not going to increase her rent to have another person living there, is it? I just don't really understand. Maybe there's more info that we don't have here, but yeah, it's very confusing as to why she wouldn't just let her move back in with her. As for your situation, I agree. There's no obligation for you to let your sister move in. Of course, it would be nice, and I'm sure you would do if you had space, but you can't then just kick out your friend for the sake of your sister. Not in the short term anyway. So yeah, there's not really much more you can do. I think your mum, rather than berating you and calling you a lesbian out of nowhere, should do the right thing and take your sister in. That's what I would do. Apparently, I'm the rude one. My aunt has cancer, three autoimmune conditions, and pneumonia. And because she's a woman of color who was overweight, doctors just kept telling her to lose weight instead of listening to her that something was wrong. So she's been sick for years at this point and only got diagnosed after losing almost 100 pounds in a matter of months because she was too sick to eat anything or keep anything down. She's doing chemo and is taking a ton of medications on a daily basis. Her two kids, my cousins, 13 and 10, have been told about her cancer and they've seen how sick she is and are actually aware that their mother might die soon. It's important to note that they've not told anyone outside of the family. They want as few people to know as possible. My younger cousin has this friend we're going to call Chad. Chad is a freaking hellion and his parents are worse. So Chad's parents have planned an adults only seven day vacation for themselves. They started planning it six months ago. They've only just now realized that they didn't get any childcare and have been attempting to manipulate my aunt and uncle into doing it. My aunt and uncle can be too polite sometimes. And I swear my uncle has a sponge instead of a spine. Earlier today, I was dropping some stuff off that they were going to borrow and Chad's parents were over trying to convince my aunt and uncle to take in their demon spawn for an entire week. To give some credit to my uncle, he is trying to say no. Oh, I don't know. We're a little busy this week. 
Are you sure you don't want to leave him with family? I'll be too busy with work. It's more likely that their family said, heck no. And these people just keep going on and on and on about how much fun the boys will have. Staying up late, playing video games, eating delicious food that my aunt will no doubt make for them. It's perfect, they say. Why don't we drop him off tomorrow afternoon? My aunt and uncle were clearly trying and failing to get them to back off. And you know what? Chad's parents most definitely knew. They just didn't care and were doing everything possible to wear them down into accepting. Well, I spent quite a bit of my life as a doormat out of concern for politeness. Since becoming an adult, I have learned to set and stick to healthy boundaries and putting my safety and well-being first. If you don't already do that, I strongly recommend giving it a try. It's fantastic. So I stepped in because not only were they just not capable of taking care of that crotch goblin, they both just looked so miserable, desperate and exhausted. But also my aunt looked the sickest I've ever seen her. This is the gist of that conversation. Sorry, they can't watch Chad while you're away. Good luck finding someone though. Um, who even are you? They ask. They clearly can watch Chad. They're just being selfish out of petty jealousy. I'm their niece. And no, they can't. I'm sorry about that, but they can't. And they've spent the last several minutes trying to tell you in the most polite way possible. You can't speak for them. And you can, because you're acting like you're entitled to their time. Besides, there's a family emergency happening with my grandmother and they need to help her. So they'll be too busy. Now that's not entirely a lie. My granny did have a huge currently ongoing health emergency, but because of my aunt's condition, we've been keeping them in the loop, but not asking them for help. You don't understand, they said. We have no other options. If they don't watch him, we'll have to either hire a nanny, which is so expensive, or cancel the trip. Now I reply with a quote that I love so much and I use it every chance I get. A lack of planning on your part does not create an emergency on theirs. You are Chad's parents. It's your job to provide for your child and no one else's. You are being so rude to us. Apologize right now. No, absolutely not. If they're not gonna watch him, are you? Because we're not leaving until we have someone to watch Chad while we're on our trip. So who is it? Them or you? Okay, you need to leave. No one here is going to provide childcare for you, so you should probably go and find someone who will. No, we're not leaving until you apologize and someone agrees to watch Chad. Chad and my cousin at this point had come downstairs because of all the yelling, and they asked what was going on. I took $10 out of my pocket, and I told Chad that if he could get his parents to leave my aunt and uncle's house, it was his. It took him less than two minutes. Best 10 bucks I've ever spent. Now, if you're wondering what exactly Chad did in those two minutes to make his family leave that quickly, um, OP did actually say below that he stood between his parents and sang Baby Shark at the top of his lungs for 20 to 30 seconds. That didn't immediately work. Then he started saying Captain Underpants catchphrases. That didn't work either. So we just started screaming. And uh, at that point they left. I mean, what a family is all I can say. I just don't get people like this. How can you book a holiday just for you, not with your kid, six months in the past and then not think about childcare? What are you expecting? I really don't know. That'd be the first thing that would obviously come to your mind before even booking the holiday, thinking, is it possible to get some childcare? If not, we obviously can't go and leave our son here. It's ridiculous, as always on this subreddit. Mum tried to bring her toddler into a dispensary. So, I live in Illinois, and it's a legal rec state for weed. Our dispensaries are 21 plus, and do not allow children in no matter what. Well, today as I was pulling into the parking lots, I see this mum loading her toddler into a stroller, and I thought it was odd. Kids should not be around weed, and even though you can't smoke at the dispensary, they have product on display, and it smells like weed in there. Now, to get into this place, you go through the front doors, and you need to have your ID scanned to get into the actual sales floor. I went in and noticed the mum right behind me, so I held the door and she went in before me. Instantly, the security and the woman working the front desk tell this mum that she is unable to to bring her child into the dispensary and the mum lost her head she started screaming that she is a single mum and has no one to watch her kid and just needs to get her weed but the staff will not budge she then exploded saying that if she can go into a grocery store to buy beer with her kid 
then she can come in here with him. Security shuts her down instantly and points to the sign that says everyone must be 21 plus to get in and no exceptions. Well, mum of the year then just says, fine, I'll go leave him in the car. This is when the front desk worker says that she is an off-duty cop and will call in that the mum left her child unattended in a hot car and the mum loses her head even more. She starts trying to pull on the locked door to the sales floor and starts screaming swear words over and over. Eventually, the front desk lady called the cops and a second security guard came out and escorted the woman to the parking lot. This is when I got the okay to go inside to make my purchase. I was in there for maybe 10 minutes and when I came out, mum of the year was being talked to by two cops in the lot because I guess she did try and actually leave her kid in her hot car and come back inside without him. My biggest problem with this woman is her taking out her anger on the staff. They're not the ones that set the rules, right? They just have to abide by them. If they are the ones that let this mum come into the weed dispensary with her toddler, something which is illegal, and then someone else, maybe their boss or law enforcement finds out, they could literally lose their jobs. They're not going to risk that for you, are they? Hey, if anything, it sounds like she could have just used the smoke to calm her down. She was getting uh, pretty angry there for no real reason. Entitled mum steals and pawns her daughter's promise ring. This just happened to my cousin and it's still a bit of an ongoing situation but it's too crazy not to post first of all some background so my cousin who we'll call cat had received a beautiful promise ring from her boyfriend at the time it had a real pearl in the center that was surrounded by mini diamonds essentially close to the quality of an engagement ring i can't remember the exact cost but i want to say he saved at least 500 to 600 dollars for it as it was treated like a long-term engagement. Obviously, between the price and the sentiment behind it, that ring meant everything to Kat, and not one time in their relationship did I ever see her not wearing it. The ring has even more meaning to it now, as the couple had to separate a few months ago due to personal issues on his side, but he told her to keep the ring on as a promise that he would return one day when everything was sorted. Now that that's out of the way, here is where the entitled mum of this story comes in. Kat's mum is a total leech of a woman who thinks everyone will bow down to her will. She refuses to work and essentially lives off of handouts from her family, but also demands to live a luxurious lifestyle. She's the type of woman who will beg for money to buy food, then turn around and waste it all at the casino. She'll do whatever she can to get money and has recently restored to guilt tripping and apparently stealing. So it was another cousin's birthday a few days ago and everyone came over for a pool party. Kat had taken off her ring and left it on my dresser so that she could go swimming, only to come back and find it missing. We tore the whole room apart looking for it in case it had fallen or maybe someone knocked it grabbing their clothes, but the ring was nowhere to be found. Kat was reasonably heartbroken and would not stop crying over the ring, blaming herself for letting it out of her sights. At the time, we still thought it was lost, so I assured her it would turn up. Fast forward to today, and Kat's mum, the entitled mum, calls my mum and asks if she wants to go out, saying she just got a nice payout, so it would be her treat. This obviously didn't make sense, since the entitled mum doesn't work. So naturally, my mum questioned where she suddenly got all the money, to which she replied that she did a little spring cleaning. It turns out she saw Kat's ring on the dresser at the party, took it, and then pawned it for not even half the price it was originally worth just so she could have the money to go out and party. I wasn't there when Kat found out, but apparently the events that occurred went as followed. When Kat angrily confronted her mother about why she took the ring, she blew it off and just kept making excuses. She kept saying that she needed the money because we're broke and that she deserved to have the ring since Kat had no use for it anymore now that she was single. Her entitled mum also argued that Kat was a child who doesn't deserve expensive items when you can't even appreciate them and that her mother's happiness should mean more to her than some dumb ring. She also got defensive and called her an ungrateful brat when she begged her to go and buy the ring back. At some point during the entitled mum's rant, Kat left and came to spend the night with us so she could calm down and figure everything out. Kat has literally spent the whole evening trying to get a hold of the pawn shop to see if she can get her ring back. And her entitled mum is messaging both me and my mum, arguing that she did nothing wrong and that Kat is making a big deal out of nothing. My mum and I refuse to talk to the entitled mum until she not only apologizes, but also tries to get the ring back. 
it's bad enough stealing and selling your child's things, but the sentiment that ring holds will never be replaceable if she can't get it back. Yeah, simple solution here, in my opinion. Just file a police report for theft and tell your mother about it. Then she'll be forced to go back and try and find the ring at least. And also if you do it quickly enough and hopefully the pawn shop hasn't already, filing that police report means that pawn shop can't then sell it on so you have a better chance of getting it in the first place. It is mental that we're even having this discussion in the first place though as I don't know how this entitled mum can think that she knows more about her daughter's relationship than her daughter. That is crazy. My entitled mother stole my heart meds to blackmail me. Strap in, this will be a long one. So this incident actually happened quite a few years ago and I feel like I'm finally at a point where I can post about it. I'm hoping sharing it and hearing what you guys have to say about what happened will bring me some measure of closure and catharsis. For some background, I, now 33 years old, non-binary, assigned female at birth, am disabled. I was born with severe Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, a genetic disorder that, among many other symptoms affecting pretty much every bodily system, causes my joints to dislocate and sublux partially dislocates with very little prompting. I once dislocated my shoulder by flumping down onto my bed from a sitting position too roughly. Wow. I wasn't diagnosed until I was 17 years old because EDS wasn't well recognized by most doctors back in the early 2000s. Having abused me in every possible sense for my entire childhood already, my extremely narcissistic alcoholic mother, the entitled parent in this story, immediately saw my diagnosis as a whole new set of ways that she could hurt me. She would forcibly dislocate my joints as punishment for entirely imagined offenses, telling me that nobody would believe me if I told them she'd done it, and she'd tell them I was just a clumsy, lying little dog which she'd already been branding me as for as long as I could remember. Her entitlement was and is deeply rooted in every aspect of her personality. She'd often stand over me, booming, as far as you're concerned, I am God. Everything under this roof is mine, my property. And that includes you and everything in your room. You don't freaking breathe without my say so. You bought it, don't give a dang. It's mine. And there isn't a bloody thing you can do about it because I am God. And she did that sober too. Yep, so entitled, she was basically delusional. My father was and remains such a pathetic excuse for a parent that I genuinely almost forgot to mention him here. He constantly enabled her abuse, convinced us it was our fault that she was abusing us and actively prevented my younger sister and me from getting help. When I was 24 years old, I was finally able to move out of my parents' house, my sister having moved out a year or two earlier, with the help and support of friends. I moved in with my best friend, but was still very much under my parents' control, psychologically. My mother would help me by picking up a particular heart medication for me from a hospital that was about 90 minutes away by bus, since I couldn't drive. She always made a massive fuss about it and what a huge favor she was doing for me, guilting me as much as she possibly could. At this point, I was so beaten down and small that I would apologize for everything. Like literally preface pretty much everything I said with, hi, um, I'm sorry, but, and end pretty much everything with, sorry again. I was a mess and nearly a decade after escaping that hellhole, I'm honestly still rebuilding my sense of self. On the day of the incident that's the focus of this story, we'd arranged for my entitled mum to pick up my meds and meet me at my local shopping mall where I'd been getting a few grocery items to give me the meds and drive me home. One of her favourite things to do has always been to make people wait for her, presumably because it gives her a sense of power over others, so I knew to expect her to be late. She'd already yelled at me over the phone that I had to be outside, standing at the curb in the car park when she pulled up, or she'd just keep driving which wasn't a bluff because she'd done that before just because I'd been sitting on a bench a few feet back when she arrived. God forbid anyone keep her waiting. So 10 minutes before the agreed upon time, I was standing at the curb, groceries bagged up and ready to go. As our meetup time passed, I had to sit down on the ground and it started raining. I should add here that being out in the cold and rain sends my chronic pain through the roof and can leave me unable to use my hands for days. So I was already annoyed at the situation, but I was also terrified of this monster of a woman. When she was 20 minutes late, I sent her a text, which took me a while because hands, asking how far away she was. I got a nasty reply saying she was on her way and I better be standing by the curb when she got there. I replied that I was sitting on the footpath in the rain, so to please not take too long. 
No reply. At 35 minutes late, I texted her again, saying I was cold, soaking wet, and in a ton of pain, asking where the heck she was and what was taking so long. It was very unusual for me to be so direct with her, but being out of their house and with people who were working to build me back up, it had given me a new boldness. And I was in so much pain, I gave far less of a dang about the consequences than usual. I was trembling with anxiety as I sent it, but it still felt empowering. She called and screamed at me down the phone about how ungrateful I was, how she was going so far out of her way to do this massive favor for me, and that I'd be lucky if she showed up at all after I'd spoken to her like that. I pointed out that the favor is somewhat negated if you cause the person harm by screwing them around in the process. And she screamed some more abuse at me, told me I'd better be standing at the curb when she got there, that she was going to beat the living daylights out of me and hung up. We had two more rounds of this until she was over an hour late and finally i was done something in me finally snapped and i was just like f it after getting on the bus safely with my waterlogged shopping bags i used speech to text to send her a final text message saying that i was done playing her ridiculous games and was taking the bus home i told her it was completely unacceptable to demand that her disabled severely chronically ill daughter stay out in the freezing rain for well over an hour and that dad would get my meds from her and drop them off at my apartment i'd already asked him and let him know what the situation was i was a blubbering mess of delirious agony and anxiety when i got home and my flatmate had to take the next day off work to look after me he'd agreed to act as my carer to help me escape my parents and his work was extremely good about it what a legend in the aftermath my entitled mum refused to give my dad the medication for me saying that if i wanted it i would have to come back begging for my forgiveness for being such an ungrateful little sh- She had this whole rant about her, of course, going on about what an awful, nasty little female dog I was, etc. She even added in some ableist stuff about how they should have killed me at birth and saved themselves two decades of medical bills because I didn't deserve everything they'd done and sacrificed for me. What a woman. She literally demanded that I show up in person, get down on my knees and grovel. She thought she had total power over me by holding a crucial medication hostage. She said a bunch of stuff about how I better comply with her demands before being without my meds made me too sick to be able to get on my knees or tough, I wasn't getting them back at all. The most bizarre part was that she genuinely seemed to believe that I'd wronged her and she was entitled not only to an apology from me for standing up for myself, I guess, but to withhold my meds from me in order to force an apology out of me because she said she knew I'd never give me what I was owed otherwise. I went to the police station to try and get them to retrieve the obviously stolen meds. Good. But was told that because I'd given the pharmacy authorization to allow my mum to collect and sign for my meds, it was legally hers to keep and there was nothing they could do. Notes, I live in Australia. I called the pharmacy and explained the whole situation to the extremely kind pharmacist who was able to organize a new prescription with my specialist through the hospital and I had a friend who worked nearby pick it up for me. In the meantime, my dad broke 24 years of consistent spinelessness and lied to my entitled mum to scare her into handing over the original stolen meds, saying that I'd gone to the police, but that he convinced me to hold off so he could give her a chance to just hand them over without police involvement. It worked, and I ended up stocked up for an extra month, but the whole incident resulted in me finally cutting all contact with my entitled mum. When he dropped off the meds, my dad tried to convince me to make peace with my mum for his sake and said that by refusing to speak to her, I was being selfish because I must know how hard it would make things for him since he had to live with her. Still riding high on that wave of boldness, I told him he was being selfish by expecting me to continue to put up with her abuse as he always did any time I tried to stand up for myself with him he got super nasty and vindictive, said some extremely hurtful, deeply personal things and left. As of a few years ago, I've now cut contact with him as well. I'm finally completely free of both of them and have a great relationship with my sister. Now that we're both adults and have a clearer perspective on how our parents parentified me and pitted us against one another as kids. I have genuinely awesome people around me these days and still live with that same flatmate. My dad was diagnosed with a terminal illness a little while back and doesn't have much time left, though I'm still not sure how I feel about that. 
he finally left my entitled mum, who, after relying on him to manage her chaotic mess of a life for decades, is utterly failing to fend for herself. She's well on her way towards ending up cold and alone, which is cathartic for me to know, to be honest. Pathologically entitled, abusive people just deserve to have the people they abuse leave them. It's that simple. If you've listened to this all the way through, thank you. Getting this all out of my head has genuinely helped. It's easy to kind of downplay and normalize crazy stuff that happens to you when it just sits in your mind for years. Wow, and there we go, leaving potentially the saddest story to last. Well, in my opinion, that was the saddest story of all three. And to be fair, I think the most tragic posts that I see on r slash entitled parents are the ones where children like this have literally been abused and neglected for their entire lives. And it's not just one event that's happened and they realize at that moment how entitled a said person is. It's when they realize that their entire lives have been completely changed and kind of ruined by people like those mentioned in this story, like those entitled parents. And they have to rebuild from the ground up really, kind of destroying everything they thought was normal and understanding that actually my parents are just terrible people. I mean, not to say that she didn't realize that along the way. Clearly she did, OP that is. But having to reset your entire life, move out, move in with people that are actually good people and just go from the beginning again is incredibly hard fair play to you and your sister for, for getting out of this situation and it's clear that your entire parents are just horrible people right they've split up with each other your mom's screwed your dad's not in a much better place even besides the illness and for you too you and your sister to come out the better side of this fair play to you for doing that because i'm sure that a lot of people would not have been able to karen screams at me for banning her thieving son for context, I work nights in a gas station. About a week ago, a couple of kids, probably no more than 15 to 16 years old, who are semi-regulars, as in I've seen them a few times before but not enough to know them, came in around 2 a.m. and pulled a runner on me with around $30 in drinks and snacks. As I'm not allowed to chase shoplifters, I do what's required and leave a note for my boss so she can pull the tapes and post the pictures for us so we can tell them to get out if they're ever stupid enough to come back. You wouldn't believe how many thieves actually are, in fact, stupid enough to come back. These two morons in particular. Welp, two days ago, I'm working my only weekly day shift, and who should walk in but my pair of thieves? And who do they have with them? One of their mothers. I immediately buckle down and tell them they need to go now. The following is how the conversation went. So, the two thieves walk in. Uh Uh-uh, you two need to go right now. The first boy said, For what? The second boy said, We didn't even do anything. You know exactly what you did, and you're banned from the store. You can leave on your own feet, or leave with a police escort. You choose. They leave, and go back to the car waiting for them at the pump. From the window, I can see them talking to the woman in the driver's seat, gesturing and pointing. She gets out of her car and storms into the store. Why the heck did you tell my son and his friend they can't be here? Mom, they ran out with nearly $30 in products. We do not allow thievery and they're banned from the store. You are welcome to come and get what they need, but if they're seen on the property, the police are going to be called. No, my son is not a thief. How dare you? Get me a manager. Gladly. She doesn't know my manager has less patience for customer rubbish than I do. Since the store isn't very big, she's already heard this exchange from the office. I bring her out and she says exactly what I did. That's a bold-faced lie. My son is a good boy. You're targeting him and his friends for no reason. You're welcome to come back and watch the tape for yourself, says my manager. Karen says she'll do just that. And once I have proof you're lying, I'll be expecting this little slur for homosexual to be fired. My manager brings Karen into the office. I accompany them. Being the assistant, it's both part of my job and a joyful experience to watch Karen's face fall when she finds out her good boy is actually a rotten thief. My manager plays the tape and Karen sees her son and his friend, clearly identifiable as their only means of a disguise with their school track hoodies pulled up over their hair. Folks, they had their freaking names on the back. They were wearing those hoodies as they sat in the car waiting. The Karen was too stunned to speak at first, but eventually remembered how to Karen and stormed out shrieking that she'd be calling corpora. For what? Who knows? But she's calling anyway. Now you would think that no matter what this Karen had said or thought before, surely after seeing her son and his friend thieving on a camera in front of her, she'd have to change her mind. But no, she doubles down. And that's how you know she's an unbelievable Karen. Fair play to her. Entitled lady dislikes the Thanksgiving dinner we are providing. 
Some years ago, my wife and I organized a holiday assistance program for our church. In October, families register for the Thanksgiving and Christmas giveaways. Usually the Monday before Thanksgiving is when we distribute the Thanksgiving dinner. This included a turkey breast or turkey and all that was needed to make a Thanksgiving dinner. The amount of food was dependent upon family size. So the breakdown was something like this. One to two people, turkey breast with all the rest. These were four to five pounds of just turkey meats. Three to four people, a 10 to 12 pound turkey with all the rest. Five to six people, a 12 to 15 pound turkey with all the rest. You get the idea. So distribution day arrives and things are going well as we're going to move about 500 families through in four hours. I act as the gatekeeper. No one in the building without their appointment card and ID. Once in, they sign in with my wife and we bring them all they need as they walk down and head out another door. Somewhere in the middle of this time, my wife comes out to get me as we have a person who is not happy. I go in and there is Karen. She eyeballs me hard in disbelief. I'm not in uniform like normal. The conversation goes something like this. What seems to be the problem? I'm here to pick up the dinner for me and my husband. And this lady won't give us a turkey. Note that she sort of sneered with the word lady. Also, my wife is Hispanic and does have a small accent when she speaks. So most ignorant people assume she's not in charge or intelligence. Rather than argue, she usually just grabs me. Mom, we are giving you a turkey. It's the turkey breast, which has more than enough meat for you and your husband. Further, we allocate the turkeys based on family size and we simply do not have any extra to give to you. This isn't good enough. We need a turkey. Note, she isn't yelling, but all eyes are definitely on us. Also, she's holding the box we gave her with everything in. I'm sorry, mom. Let me take back what you have and I'll see what I can do. I take back the box and hand it off to one of the staff and then turn back around. Okay, mom. Again, I'm sorry we weren't able to accommodate your wishes today. The exit is this way and you have a happy Thanksgiving. The Karen is dumbfounded. Wait, what? Well, you've expressed that this meal wasn't good enough for you and I would never impose upon anyone something they considered substandard. So again, the exit is this way and have a nice day. I walked her to the exit door and as I walked back through the line to the entrance, I ask, is there anyone else with an issue they need addressing? A few audible nopes and a few chuckles were heard, but that was that. I will point out at Christmas time, she was able to receive what she signed up for with no complaints. So I'm glad she picked up on that. We were able to help around 500 families for each holiday and our volunteers loved it. Entitled people bother me to no end, but she was one person in all of that. So it was definitely a success and worth it. Sorry, let me get this straight. Is this woman really complaining about free food on Thanksgiving when everyone else in that church is delighted because they're getting free food and they're probably extremely grateful and you and your wife OP are doing an amazing job as well as all the other volunteers and staff. The one person there is complaining about free food. That's insane. And also two pounds of turkey per person. Isn't that loads anyway? Like more than you could eat? Unbelievable. It really is. Big group thinks they own the forest because they come all the time. A few months ago, towards the end of the season in this area, I went camping with my friends, three women. The spot we chose was on a cliff with a great view of a canyon and the creek at the bottom. The area allows dispersed camping and there are very few spots with that view and it's first come first serve. When we arrived, only one spot was left with the view hidden behind trees, but only a few feet away. The view could only be accessed by walking straight through our camp. I think there are other spots you can hike to without going through a campsite. On our first night there, a couple, two men, walked into our camp, saying they wanted to see the view. I wasn't super comfortable because you can't trust a stranger in a forest and they were in our space, but they were only there for a few minutes and left. The next day, we went to watch the sunset on the cliff and had left all our stuff lying around camp when we start hearing cars, dogs, voices, and screaming kids. Two cars pulled up to our camp and walked right in, making themselves comfortable. We ran back to see that all of our space was completely invaded. Kids under our tarp and running around the tent poles, people around our fire, etc. We had a small puppy with us that was terrified of the new dog, but these people didn't care. A woman explained that they live nearby and love coming to see the view. I was in absolute shock at the disrespect. Everyone is allowed to enjoy nature and it was a public spot, but you have the respect if someone is there first, at least have the decency to ask. As they were leaving, well, after sunset, the same woman said they'd be coming later that night to see the stars. My friends were so angry and I was still in shock. As they were loading their car, I ran up to them and said the first thing that came to mind. I asked one of the men, hey, 
When you come back later, are you planning on bringing the kids? Uh, I'm not sure. Why is that? Replied the man. Well, the thing is, we're out here to do heavy drugs. We're starting in a few minutes and things might get pretty wild and I wouldn't want to expose children to that. You as adults might be able to handle it, but I don't know what will happen. By the way, I don't do any drugs and I only drink occasionally. They never came back, thank God. And hopefully they learned something about respecting people's space. Okay, wow, OP, that's actually brilliant from you. Can you imagine going to see the stars with your children on a nice relaxing night and then instead you just see like, I don't know, a bunch of adults monging out or tripping on acid or something? That would be extremely scary. Uh, unless you joined in, then it might be quite fun. Who knows? But yeah, to think of that on the spot and deliver it like that, unbelievable. Because what a normal person would have done, for example, me in that situation, I probably would have said something that would have started an argument. Whereas you just came up with a little piece of brilliance that destroyed them. Unbelievable. Another snotty, entitled, racist douche. I am a Midwestern white guy of Scottish descent. If I get too much sun, I'll explode in plaid flames I'm so white. My wife and kids are not. My wife and kids are Mexican, and my presence makes family barbecues interesting, and I've been known to harness the power of my whiteness when police are called because a birthday party for an eight-year-old niece or nephew gets out of hand. Now that we have that out of the way, one of my Mexican sons married a Guatemalan woman. Needless to say, they speak a lot of Spanish. Occasionally, I find myself out with my daughter-in-law, and as a South American woman, she absolutely cannot function without a high enough coffee to blood ratio. So we're sitting in a certain mermaid themed coffee shop in a mall, having a conversation, gasp, in Espanol. Have you ever wondered how you know if the person that says, this is America and we speak English here, is a racist idiot or just a lazy self-entitled idiot? Well, it's moments like this. When the racist idiot sees two people having a private conversation in Spanish and walks by the white guy to instead harass the pregnant Latin woman. Now, anybody who has ever met a Latina knows that. One, you annoy them at your own risk. This is a good way to find out if a high-heeled shoe can be absorbed rectally. I'll neither confirm nor deny that I already know the answer to this question. And two, when you anger a Latina, you will get no help from others. They know better. They also don't want to get any of you on them when she starts ripping your vital organs out of your own butt. So, this racist sea hag hitches up her Louboutins, clutches her Michael Kors bag, struts past me, bends right down in my daughter-in-law's face, and screams at the top of her lungs, speak English or go back where you came from, you naughty word. People are destroying this country. My daughter-in-law stands up and without a word, slaps the Gucci sunglasses right off of her face and sits back down. Sea Hag's head spins around. She takes the time to look around and lays down on the ground, screaming at the top of her lungs that this foreign immigrant terrorist has just assaulted her for no reason. Call the police, call the army. She can't wait until everyone figures out that this election is a fraud and Trump kicks all of you, again, naughty word, immigrants out. Seahag's husband comes running over and is just about to get in my daughter-in-law's face when I stand up. Let's just say I absolutely dwarf this guy. I stand over six feet tall, have a beard down to my chest, and I pick heavy things up and put them down again in my spare time. As a result, I tip the scales north of 300 pounds, and each of my thighs is larger than my daughter-in-law's waist. The guy is maybe 5'6", and with $6 in change in each pocket, might weigh 125. I take one look at this guy, and he goes whiter than he already was. And I say, think very hard. Any part of you that touches her, I'm going to break off and force feed to you. Now, go away and take that thing with you, as I point to Sea Hack. They slink off to sit in a booth on the other side of the coffee shop. Naturally, someone has called the police, who show up in short order. Sea Hack immediately launches into her speech about how she was just minding her own business. And out of nowhere, this crazed Islamic terrorist attacked her and started beating the heck out of her. And that red beard race traitor beat the heck out of her husband and laughed at him. She thinks his nose might be broken. They both need to be in jail now. The second cop comes over to our table and my daughter-in-law turns on the waterworks. The crazy woman started screaming at me. I was just defending myself. She places her hand on her stomach and my baby. I summon my powers of whiteness and tell the officer, I'm certain this place has cameras. 
there are at least a dozen witnesses to that woman screaming to raid and i assure you that my daughter-in-law will not be answering any more of your questions without her attorney presence the cops take a few minutes to talk to a couple of other people look at the security footage and come back to tell us that while my daughter-in-law probably shouldn't have slapped her it's pretty clear that it was in self-defense and while they will be filling out a report they won't be arresting anyone. And there we go. A beautifully written story. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, the icing on the cake there is just calling her Sea Hag. What a lovely, lovely name. Very apt and very lovely. I've got to say as well, good on your daughter-in-law. First of all, for standing up for herself. But second of all, for turning on the waterworks. Because ultimately, she was the one that legally was in the wrong here. She was the one that I guess technically assaulted the Karen. The Karen didn't legally do anything wrong. Actually, that's not really true, is it? Racism is illegal. But I guess it might not have shown up on the cameras if there was no audio. And that might just go down to hearsay. I don't know. Good thing that she didn't get in trouble and a fair play to the police for not arresting anyone. Although if they were going to arrest anyone, it should have been Sea Hag, that's for sure. Babysitting means paying the kids dental bills. Here's a fun one. Years ago, I would often babysit my neighbor's 9 to 10 year old daughter. He was a divorced father with the kind of ex that would send spreadsheets of child rearing expenses calculated to the penny and weekly invoices complete with terms and penalties of her own choosing for late payments. He paid big child support and generally paid his invoices on time because she would cut off access to the kiddo if he didn't. His ex, the snake, and I had basic text messaging contact. She and I had a previous dust up because a sudden weather change necessitated a jacket for her kid. We popped into the nearest discount store and I let her pick a jacket. The kid loved it, but her mother threw a giant fit at me because it wasn't brand named. I blew it off and the neighbor and I laughed about it when he reimbursed me. She gave me the silent treatment. Darn. Time moved forward. The father always reimbursed kiddos expenses and encouraged fun and healthy activities. One day, he called me and apologized that he was getting held up at work and the kiddo had an orthodontist appointment. He asked me to take her and I agreed and he called the dentist to authorize. We got there and they wouldn't see her without a payment, $225. It was necessary. The kid's braces were hurting her. Dad wasn't available, but I knew he'd reimburse me. So I put it on my credit card rather than call her snake of a mother. The kiddo got patched up. Dad reimbursed me. I paid the card and didn't use it. A few months later, I got a past due call from my card company. Repeat charges from the orthodontist. I let the dad know and called the orthodontist, who told me that I'd signed an automatic payment agreement. I gave my heck no, I'm just the babysitter speech and didn't get far with them. So I canceled the card. Dad apologized profusely and reimbursed me. A month later, I get a nasty call from the orthodontist about my card declining. I kindly inform them I'm not the parents and provide the snake's phone number. About an hour later, the snake is furiously calling and texting me. I silenced my phone and looked later. She'd maxed out my voicemail and all of her text messages were about how I was abusing her child by denying the kid medical care. One voicemail was from the police, letting me know she filed a complaint how I could get a copy from my attorney and inquiring about whether I wanted to file a counter complaint. I sure did. I moved out of state and the prosecutor called me once just to ask questions. Then I never heard back from the prosecutor. Last I heard from the kiddo's grandmother, the snake took a plea bargain. Dad got custody and grandma was enjoying a lot more time with kiddo. Okay, wow. When I first read the title of this, I thought that what was going to happen did in the sense that I thought that this mum or any parent might try and charge a babysitter for their kids or the dentist appointment. But I did not think that they would then ask them to keep paying the recurring fees every single time even after they've moved state and stopped babysitting the kid. Like even even on r slash entitled parents, that did not cross my mind. I thought it'd be one-off payment for $200 or whatever. That doesn't surprise me. It's entitled parents. But to do it again and again and again, even when they no longer work for you, that was beyond my wildest expectations, even for this subreddit. I guess that just shows how far that, that we've come. Um, unreal. Even I am now surprised when I read stuff on this subreddit after three years of doing so incredible and there we go guys that is going to do it three hours of some of the very best entitled parent stories of 2022 the year is coming to a close which uh if anything is kind of scary where's the time gone if you enjoyed it and you watched and listened to the entire thing then i love you and if you want more even after those three hours it's up on screen right now down below in the description on whatever platform you're on and i'll see you guys all tomorrow with a brand new reddit episode